What's good, everybody, and a welcome to another episode of the What's Good Games podcast, your source for video game news, commentary, analysis, and funny stuff every Friday. I'm Andrea Renee, joined by Miss Brittany Brombacher. I just had a very spicy drink of this blinking owl bourbon, and everything in my body is clenching right now. <laughs> I don't know what happened. Uh, we are both enjoying some delicious blinking owl bourbon, courtesy of our dear friend Solid Snake Ocelot, a uh, friend and supporter of the show. Um, thank you so much for joining us, everybody. If you missed it, Brittany and I are drinking bourbon because we just got done with our XO19 live reaction stream, which you can catch on youtube.com slash what's good games if you've missed it and you want to watch the archive. Of course, Xbox is in London doing their annual fan community event, and they had a bunch of stuff to announce, which we'll talk about in just a little bit. Before we get to that, we've got just a little bit of housekeeping. As you guys know, Steimer is still in Europe. This is her last week on the road. She will be back next week to tell us all about her European adventure. But if you want to keep up with what she's doing over there, of course, you can follow her at Case Steimer on Instagram where she is posting a bunch of stuff. She's also tweeting a little bit too. So, Oh, yeah. Right now, at this very moment, she is very drunk. And her Twitter right now is a blessing to all of us. <laughs> Definitely, you should check it out. She's my favorite. I was going to say she's my favorite when she's drunk, but then that makes it sound really bad, right? I love Steimer unconditionally. Here's my P PC PR spin. But she's extra entertaining after a few adult beverages. Uh, aren't we all? Aren't we yeah. all? I think I saved myself. But you are correct in saying that she is particularly fun when she's enjoyed a few beverages. But uh, we are excited to have her back, and we are glad that she had a really great time from what we've talked to her about and what we've seen so far. But for now, it's just the Brit and Andrea show this week. We've had a couple of awesome guests over the past couple of weeks. If you missed it last week, we had Sabriel Mastin on the show, and before that, we had Rihanna Manuel. Um, we have some other people lined up for later in the year yeah. slash. What are our shows called when we're just you? We've only, I think, done one show where it's just you and I. Maybe two. Um, I don't know. Brandria, Brand, Brandria, Brittany. I don't know. And and Brittany. No, that sounds and Brittany. That might Ew. work. You like that? It sounds like a really bad drink that you'd get at a bar. It, I have an and Brittany. <laughs> <laughs> Do you know what I mean? Yeah. Like cheap shit that you'd get at like a college party that'd fuck you up. That nah, sounds. That sounds right. Like jungle juice. <laughs> no one wants. Yeah. That. Yeah. You think you do. You think you want. In your first sip, you're like, oh, this isn't that bad. And then and then you're blocked out. It's not good. Yeah. And then you're over a toilet. Exactly. A uh, yep. <laughs> That's what the Anne Drittany will do to you. Indeed. And also what our Patreon streams will do to you. Oh, just kidding. They won't do that. But if you go to patreon.com slash what's good games, you'll get access to exclusive streams, including our happy hour Q&A and our after hour stream, which are happening next week. On Thursday, November 21st, we're still working out the timing, so please keep your eyes peeled on our social platforms and, of course, at patreon.com slash what's good games. We will announce all of those details very soon. And today, I'm making a very special appearance on friend of the show and all around wonderful person, Naomi Kyle's channel on caffeine.tv. So she's got a brand new show called Last Week in Gaming that is debuting on caffeine.tv slash Naomi Kyle. It's going live at 6 p.m. Pacific time is when you'll be able to catch me on the show. And hopefully you guys will check it out and give her a follow um, and send her some love and say what's good game sent you. Uh, we yeah. are big fans of Naomi's and we definitely need to get her back on the show. It's been a hot minute since she's guested on what's good games. I think the last time we had her on was during the Battlefront 2 fiasco. Oh my gosh, that was forever ago. Yeah, like November of 2017 or something like that. It was a long time ago. Yeah. So yeah, she's overdue. Well, she moved away from the Bay, so it was difficult to get her on the show. But now I'm here. Yeah. She's here. We're building this new studio. It's going to be great. Um, speaking of the new studio, I put up an exclusive Patreon vlog giving you guys a sneak peek into how the construction is going if you're interested. Mm -hmm. So, continuing on, a big thank you to this month's Patreon producers, Alex Rogopoulos, Chewy's godson, Ferris Atan, Mohammed Mohammed, and welcome to our Patreon community, Catherine Birchovic. Um, <laughs> this is clearly somebody <laughs> just typing into the keyboard, H-K-G. No, no, you have to pronounce it out. Hug and huck. <laughs> hug, huck. It's just about the consonants I, together, you guys. <laughs> And so Queen Sindel has finally joined us. 
So um, the queen and I talk a lot on Twitter. And oh my God, Brittany, did you see the brand new Screaming Sindel trailer for Mortal Kombat 11 that came out this week? Yes. Oh my God, it's so good. She's so sexy. She really is. She's one of my all-time faves uh, from the Mortal Kombat universe. And what's really cool about what they showed off in the trailer is that they adopted her original stance from her very first appearance in Mortal Kombat, mm-hmm. which is like mm-hmm. a nice throwback for fans. Um, mm-hmm. But I'm excited to play with her. And uh, I really am looking forward to jumping back into Mortal Kombat and kind of just like tooling around because I haven't played it since the game launched back in April. So it's yeah, been I just a while. missed it entirely, and I'm really sad about it. You can still play. It's a great campaign. Just you know, drop it down on a baby of- ass baby mode. Play through the campaign. You won't regret it. You see, there's this game coming out tonight, all about these little fictional creatures. Some Those of them pocket are bongs, bongs. <laughs> pocket thrusters, <laughs> the pocket monsters. <laughs> We've had some bourbon. It's fine. It's true. It's we have. It's true. Pocket monsters. Well, we're gonna talk about Pokemon in a little bit too. So let's get into the news, shall we? But before we do that, we've got to tell you it's brought to you by Manscaped. (laughs) Of course, support for What's Good Games comes from our friends over at Manscaped who know the best in men's below-the-belt grooming. Manscaped offers precision-engineered tools for your family's jewels. I love that rhyme. (laughs) So jingle balls to the walls, fellas. (laughs) Listen up. It's the holiday season, and that means... That untrimmed pubes are a thing of the past. It's time to gear up and get yourself the gift of shaving this holiday season. And we are talking about the Manscaped Perfect Package 2.0. So this is where I get to tell you guys how exciting it is that I get to kind of creep on the Manscaped kit that they sent Mm -hmm. for, for John to use. They actually included a very nice manicuring set, which anybody can use, by the way. It comes with a really nice nail clipper and a a little scissor for trimming cuticles and things like that. Um, And what Manscaped is great about is really bringing awareness to people out there that have genitals that include balls that maybe aren't thinking about grooming the way that they should be. And this is why Manscaped is revolutionary, you guys, really, because they've redesigned the electric trimmer. Their Lawn Mower 2.0 has proprietary advanced skin-safe technology, so this trimmer won't nick or snag your nuts. It's also waterproof, so you can bring it in the shower. You mm-hmm. know, just mm-hmm. knock it out while you're in there. Make it easy yeah. on yourself. The Lawn Mower 2.0 comes inside the Perfect Package 2.0, which makes for the perfect gift this holiday season. It's literally everything you need to keep trimmed, cut free, and smelling nice down there. And don't use that same trimmer on your face boys you yeah if you put it on your balls don't put it on your face i mean unless that's your thing and if that's the case no judgment uh the manscape perfect package also includes the crop preserver and anti-chafing ball deodorant and moisturizer you already put deodorant on your armpits why are you not putting deodorant on the smelliest part of your body and yes Don't play. Your balls stink. You know, they do. And speaking (laughs) of sweaty and stinky balls, uh, we're thankful for their crop reviver. You guys, listen, just go with it. This is hilarious. I love this. I love that Manscaped sponsors our show. We've got a a lot of fantastic men that maybe need to hear that their balls smell. This product, (laughs) along with the crop preserver, keeps your balls from sweating, smelling, and sticking. Ooh, that's Mm. the worst. No one likes it when you got a fucking pad of gum on your leg. It's gross. Pad of gum? Did you ever have a friend that would do that as a joke? And be like, oh, I have gum on my leg. I'm really, which is no, a No, no, no. I've had many male friends who tell me that there's nothing more satisfying in life than removing a sticky ball from your leg. I've heard that. <laughs> but I've never heard the gum thing. That's the new one. Maybe it's a regionalism that only my male friends made jokes about. Yeah, um, did I mention that these products smell good? Their manly scent is attractive and will help set the mood, if you know what oh. I mean. Wink, wink. <laughs> the perfect package also comes with a pair of Manscaped boxer briefs that will keep your junk feeling fresh all day. It's time to upgrade that overused pair of boxers to Manscaped high-performance anti-chafing boxer briefs. Tis the season to Manscaped, so get yourself, your dad, your brother, your friends, the best gift of all, the Manscaped Perfect Package 2.0. Get 20% off plus free shipping with the code What's Good at Manscaped.com and your balls will thank you. That's 20% off and free shipping with code what's good at manscaped.com. Again, one more time, 20% off and free shipping. Clean up your nuts and make Santa proud this year. <laughs> is that is that what, you know, people did wrong back in childhood days when Santa wouldn't bring you what you wanted? Your nuts weren't clean? I mean, I don't know. 
It said I could sniff out your nuts and then he would give you coal. And you're like, sorry, your balls aren't clean enough coal for you. Your balls. Yeah. Yep. That makes sense. <laughs> it all makes sense now. Oh God. Amazing. That's my favorite ad read ever. Yeah. No, we love, we love the folks over at Manscaped. Listen, they're doing the Lord's work, making sure yeah. balls are not sweaty and not sticky. Mm-hmm. All right. Let's actually get into the news now. Our first story is all about XO19. As we've already mentioned, we did a live reactions. We actually delayed the taping of the podcast so we could include it because we knew it was going to be a bunch of stuff. And OMG, was it oh boy. ever. So, Britt, you pulled this recap from IGN. Do you want to get us kicked off? Yeah. So just a heads up, there is a lot of stuff that dropped. And we're shooting the show not far, not long after XO19, the Inside Xbox episode wrapped up. So maybe we've missed a few things. But, you know, just love us unconditionally. So all these following stories are from IGN. The first one is, again, new Rare game, Everwild, announced. Rare has revealed the name of its new IP during the XO19 presentation today, called Everwild. There aren't a whole lot of details yet for the developer's next big game, but the studio did premiere a new trailer you can watch above. Everwild is still early in development, but Rare says that the Everwild team is focused on building an experience that allows for new ways to play in a natural and magical world. Development on Everwild is being led by executive producer Luis Ocana, and Rare says that it'll be sharing more about the game in the future. Rare says, even with development on Everwild, Sea of Thieves is a primary focus for the studio. Quote, having two large games in development represents a tremendous opportunity for Rare and the talented staff here as we grow and further evolve the studio to meet the challenges of simultaneously operating a successful live service and being in pre-production for a new IP, Rare says. So this was the first thing that I think kicked off the stream, or was it? Yeah, it was one of the first things. Anyway, at this time, we were watching uh, XO19 on Mixer, and the whole thing went down. So by the time we got the stream up and running on Twitch, we missed like 99% of this trailer. I think the reason why we don't have much to say about it is because Mixer's stream went down. That's what I was saying. <laughs> when Everwild was, was revealed. But here's my thing. I am interested in Rare as a studio But that being said, this art style is not really speaking to me as a player. And I don't like that I get instantly turned off by games just because of their art style. I don't like that about myself. But I I can't help it. I don't know what to do about it, Brittany. No, no, don't feel bad because I'm the same way. I... Exactly. Yeah, I'm the same way. Especially with more like cartoon style graphics, they turn me off. But, you know it looks pretty like I said the colors are nice and beautiful vibrant and bright but when you when I see a game like this unfortunately you know what I think it is I gotta look at this person's face when I see a game like this I think of something that's not entirely story focused just because I want to be able to read like characters faces like I want to know their eyes going up are they going down are they mad angry what are they doing with their face this one looks like it has facial animation so maybe I'm totally off the base but it just doesn't I don't I don't know I don't know, Andrea. It looks pretty. I hope they do good. That's all I. That's all I got. I mean, it's rare. They'll do good. Mm. I mm-hmm. believe in them, and Xbox supports them, which is the most important thing. I think one of the themes that we saw in XO19 was not only were cartoon-focused games a big feature of this stream, but that also a lot of the games that we saw I would not call AAA. I would call Double A or Indie, and that was a big a. Not a letdown, because I think we all figured that we wouldn't, we weren't going to see a, a Halo teaser, right? Like a Halo Infinite mm. teaser was not going to happen here. If anything, that'll happen at the Game Awards. Uh, but more realistically, we're probably going to get a, a not a, a full look until E3 next year. But that said, I was kind of hoping they would have a little bit more in the way of AAA. But I'm getting ahead of myself here. So yeah. Um, so just for your reference, I'm on the the. the YouTube channel and the little blurb is introducing Everwild a brand new world in development at Rare where a unique and unforgettable experience will await dot 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 so yeah we, we know nothing there's just it nothing nada we know Zero. nothing John we know Zero. nothing but but that's a Game of Thrones reference I it know is. that but Good the more job, I'm looking right? at it thanks the more I'm looking at it I'm gonna retract almost everything I said earlier I'm sorry I'm going back on my word. Okay. I, I do. Yeah. There's a lot more detail in the animation and in the art than I had thought there was. So my turned off meter isn't as great as it once was. Oh, good. Glad. There we go. Mm-hmm. 
<laughs> All right, moving on. <laughs> Grounded was announced as a new co-op survival game from Obsidian. Uh. Today, Xbox announced that Obsidian Entertainment has a first-person cooperative survival game in the works called Grounded, and it's going to be playable early next year. In fact, they said spring 2020. Of course, Obsidian Entertainment is the studio behind the recently released The Outer Worlds, plus other games like Fallout New Vegas, Star Wars Knights of the Old Republic, and South Park The Stick of Truth, among other games. In this game... Crowned is a creative take on the survival genre where you've been shrunken down to the size of an ant and must gather, craft, and build bases in a suburban backyard environment. While we were streaming, I said, it's honey, I shrunk the Fortnite. You did say that. Because that's what it feels like. The art style feels like Fortnite, and there's building, but you're really little. And there's yeah. ants. There's big baseball. Uh, so it's playable alone with up to three players, and it aims to turn the familiar features of an everyday yard into a dangerous environment, a la... Honey, I shrunk the kids. <laughs> to survive, you'll need to harvest the materials and resources at your disposal. Working with an acorn into a makeshift body armor and slurping up hydrating drops of watery dew are two examples <laughs> given of how you'll be able to survive in the backyard frontier. Backyard? Backyard. Backyard, backyard frontier Arble. as you work through <laughs> starting-based <laughs> missions and open exploration. Quote, we first saw Grounded in Development last year when Obsidian Entertainment joined our team, said Matt Booty, head of Microsoft Studios. The game exemplifies the innovation we're excited to see from them in the years ahead. So, what do you think, Britt? This was surprising. Um, you know, the word on the street, the rumor was is that we were going to see something from Obsidian. This is obviously not what I was expecting to see. Obsidian Zone for their RPGs. And when this game was revealed, they had two folks on stage, and I can't remember their names. I'm so sorry, but they work at Obsidian. And I'm happy that they address the fact that, you know, hey, we know we're known for RPGs. We have a lot of things going on during different times. So we're going to be talking about our RPGs in the future. So that makes me feel a little better. But yeah, this was just... You know, it, it does nothing for me. It doesn't blow my skirt up. It doesn't do any of that stuff. But it's cool, I guess, that they're getting to try something new. And maybe that's something exciting for them to venture away from the RPGs that they're known for. But, you know, when I think of acquiring studios from, you know, Microsoft's perspective, it's because you want to make exclusive titles that are going to sell your consoles. And a game like Grounded, with all due respect, is not going to sell consoles. And um, it's just kind of an interesting choice, but, you know, maybe we'll hear more about what Obsidian's working on behind the scenes soon. I think it's a balance that is tough for developers to strike, right? We talk about wanting to see big AAA games, and obviously we really enjoyed our time with The Outer Worlds, and we talk about, oh, The Outer Worlds 2 seems like a logical next step. Mm -hmm. But developers have their own agendas. They have their own passions and their own mm -hmm. desires and creative influences. And so I think it's tough when you get a studio that's known for a very specific type of game that then pivots to doing something else and having the fans, you know, justifiably be wary or hesitant until the studio can prove that they can deliver on that, right? I think a really mm -hmm. perfect example of a success story of this, even though it wasn't from a triple A to a smaller title, it was from a triple A to a triple A, um, is Guerrilla Games, right? Known for um, a first person shooter and then, tri you know, kind of pivoting to third person action adventure and really kind of nailing it, you know, going from Kill Zone to Horizon in case you were, uh, you know, Kill Zone to Horizon uh, Zero Dawn. And like the idea that they, nailed that with flying colors I think was fantastic but not every developer could do that so you know when they got on stage they were talking about how they had a passion to make this kind of game to make a survival game and this is what they came up with and I hope that it is successful because I like to see devs being given the creative freedom to pursue projects that make them excited and make them passionate about their work versus mm -hmm. being forced to work on a <laughs> franchise or forced to work on in a genre that they're not really excited about, but they just excel in because we've all been there where you're like, okay, this isn't making me happy inside, <laughs> but I could do it well enough that I can, you know, get someone to pay me for it. Mm -hmm. It's like the story of, most jobs <laughs> that people have it's like <laughs> you know I did this thing because it pays the bills but it's not exactly you know blowing my skirt up so I think that that's a challenging thing for 
fans to understand is because we want what we want when we want it. Uh But they have wants and desires too. So if it makes them happy and it does well for them, I think it's great. It's just not the game for me, Andrea Renee. Word, girlfriend. Put a pin in that. Yeah. Perfectly said it. Look at you. All right. You want to read the next one? <clears throat> oh, I actually meant to delete this, but we can read it since it's here. Uh, we can, sea of Thieves. We can delete it. <laughs> it's okay. We'll talk about Sea. We'll talk about Pirates. Arr. Sea of Thieves' new update, Seabound Soul adds fiery new weapon. Rare has announced the next round of content coming to its live service pirate sim, the Seabound Soul. It'll be available for free November 20th. It'll add lore focused tall tale mission for players who want to team up with Captain Pendragon to undercover to uncover some kind of mystery around the ship, the Ashen Dragon. They're also teasing a new threat. There's new ammo coming called firebombs. That's just me summing everything up. Basically, it looks like Sea of Thieves is still trucking along. Sounds like they're still making some great progress and updating the game. I just wish, again, I know this is just going to fall in deaf ears. PVE. Just give me PVE, please. Please. (sighs) Not going to happen, but... Because, like, I think they've added a lot of cool things, and it sounds like they've really optimized the game, just from what I heard. And I know who people who are playing are really enjoying it. But I just, the last time I played Sea of Thieves, I spent over an hour collecting treasure, and then my ship was sunk, and I lost all progress. And there's nothing more I hate more in a game than losing progress. I hate, hate it. And this is, like, the epitome of that. Yep. So, it ain't for me. I got time to lose progress. No! Mm-mm. I was on a beach. I found treasure. I dug that shit up. And some Joe Blow ass liquor 69 is going to come by in his ship and sink it and take my shit and run with it. And I just, I don't, I don't roll with that, you know? Nope. I'm with you. No? All right. This next announcement is probably my favorite of everything yes. we saw at XO19 today. Tell me why is the new episodic game from Life is Strange Studio, Don't Nod. You guys know that we've done a lot of work with Don't Nod over the last couple of years. They worked with Square Enix to sponsor our PAX West party, which was amazing. And I've hosted several panels, uh, both with Don't Nod and with Duck Nine about the Life is Strange franchise. So when Don't Nod's name came up on screen, both Brittany and I were like, ooh, what's next for them? So the game is called Tell Me Why. And it's a true-to-life narrative venture that features the first first playable transgender video game hero from a major studio and a publisher. Tell Me Why's first of three chapters will be released on Xbox One and Windows 10 PC in summer 2020 and also will be part of Xbox Game Pass and available for purchase on Steam. Their newest title is set in small town Alaska and places you at the heart of a mystery in an intimate, true-to-life story where twins, Tyler and Allison Ronan, use their extraordinary bond to unravel memories of a loving but troubled childhood. Quote, the core mechanic of the game is a special bond between Tyler and Allison and they share that they share. It is also a theme strongly anchored into the Don't Nod storytelling approach, says Florent Guillaume. Guillaume? Guillaume. 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 Uh, who is the game director at Don't Nod. Uh, Over the course of the story, players will explore the identical twins, different memories of key events, and choose which memory to believe. Ultimately, the choices players make determine the strengths of the twins' bond and the future course of their lives. I am here for this. (laughs) This is exactly what I want from Don't Nod. Uh, They've been crushing it narratively with the Life is Strange franchise, and uh, I was also very happy to hear that Don't Nod worked closely with Microsoft and the LGBTQ media advocacy organization GLAAD to ensure that Tyler is an authentic representation of the trans experience as well as a genuine multidimensional character. My, uh, the quote is from Nick Adams, the director of transgender representation at GLAAD, and he says, Microsoft and Don't Nod have approached Tyler with a real commitment to authenticity. Tyler is a fully realized, endearing character whose story is not reduced to simplistic trans tropes, <laughs> creating a playable lead trans character and taking such care to get it right raises the bar for future lgbtq inclusion in gaming so hats off to don't nod for taking on this and really making it a priority to feature a trans character in their game i can't wait to see what they do yeah when we saw this uh revealed i think because i think what the thing that perked our ear is when as you see 
this young man chatting and he said she always wanted me talking about his mom I believe to be her perfect little girl I believe that was the quote Mm -hmm. and we're like huh did we hear that right oh my gosh this is actually a feature transgender character and my first thought was you know I wasn't worried because I feel like if there's any studio that's going to get this right it's going to be don't nod they know how much their story resonates with fans of their work their stories that they tell and I was really happy to hear later in chat that um, as we were watching the rest of the stream, someone put in this info in there, how they are working with Glad, And I was like, yes. I mean, I'm not surprised they are, but it's still just reassuring anyway. And this last part of the story, <laughs> Don't Not is promising Tell Me Why's three chapters will release on a clear and predictable schedule. Basically, the unpredictable gaps between episodes hopefully won't be a thing anymore. That was a They've big, yeah, that was a big kind of um, bucket of cold water on Life is Strange Ew. 2. Now, I really have been loving that, and I'm really looking forward to how they're going to wrap up season two and what they're going to do with this final episode that's coming out um, in December. And it, But it was tough, you know? Like, they really spaced those episodes out a lot more than what Deck Nine did with Before the Storm. And, and so I think it's it's tough for people to stay invested in the, in the mm-hmm. story when there's such a long gap between episodes. I don't mind the episodic format because I think it – breaks up the gameplay in more manageable chunks to be able to play in a single episode in one playthrough excuse me that's like you know like a two to four hour playthrough depending on how much exploration you do but you know to put it all out at once I think is also a way to do it but like to space the episodes out as far as they have been I think hopefully they'll be able to I'd rather them hold the development until yeah. multiple episodes are ready and then put them out like, you know, even like once a week, I wouldn't be opposed to. But even like That's, once a month would be better than once every two to three months. I would love once a week or at least once every two weeks, because even once a month, I mean, the way things are right now, there's so many games to play that whenever I go back to these games, I know in the beginning they have a recap of what happened in the last episode, but even then it doesn't cover everything. So then I always find myself watching replays and then I forget everything that's happened. Right. So. Thank you for listening. Much appreciated. Yeah. And this is really cool. This is really, really cool. All right. Next story. Microsoft xCloud streaming service free preview adds 50 games coming to Windows 10 PCs. What? Okay. Beep, beep, Microsoft, beep, beep, beep. Has, woo. Microsoft has announced more than 50 games, including Madden NFL 20 and Devil May Cry 5, are now available in the Project X Cloud preview. Additionally, Xbox's preview of its game streaming service will be headed to the Windows 10 P- headed to Windows 10 PCs next year, alongside support for the DualShock 4 and other Bluetooth controllers. It was funny during the stream when they announced DualShock 4, someone in the audience goes, "Boo." <laughs> You silly kids. Oh, Project <laughs> Project X Cloud preview began last month for certain participants in the US, UK, and Korea, and Halo 5 Guardians, Gears 5, Killer Instinct, and Sea of Thieves were available to stream for all who were chosen to test out the service. As it stands, Project X Cloud preview is only accessible via phone or tablet running Android 6.0 or higher, but Microsoft is looking to change that. In addition to bringing it to Windows 10 PCs next year, and it is, quote, collaborating with a broad set of partners to make game streaming available on other devices as well. Support for how the games are played is also being expanded with the next year's support for Bluetooth controllers other than the Xbox One Wire. Where I already got that in there. Anyway, if you want to sign up, you can go to xbox.com slash whatever, figure it out, and then you can try to get chosen. That's all I got. So, cool. I mean, I was hoping that we were going to get some news about it coming to iOS because I would like to test this out, but we didn't hear anything about that. Just about Windows 10 PCs, which is like... Cool, okay. And I also appreciate it. I think it was Phil Spencer when he was on stage reiterated that yeah, like this is a beta. Like we're we're just we're appreciating everyone's patience. Like thank you for hopping in and let us let us collect the data and like doing all the things. And I think that's really important and you know, we'll talk about Stadia later, but it's a message that Stadia could have benefited giving out as well. Yeah, no, I'm I'm with you. I think the thing that was important from Phil's takeaway um, was definitely that this tech is is not ready. Um, and I I think that it's smart of them to hold it in preview and keep testing and testing and testing until it is ready for release. And iOS will probably be one of the last platforms to launch for obvious reasons, right? Like Microsoft's infrastructure is in the PC and the Android world. And while they do have a lot of features available on iOS, um, it makes sense that they would wait to test that until last. 
because this is really meant to be a push for current PC and Xbox users. So the thing that we were confused about that we got a little bit of clarification about was, did they announce that Xbox Game Pass works independently of owning a PC or an Xbox? <clears throat> and that was the thing that we still have not gotten crystal clear clarification on it sounds like they all have more to say on that topic <laughs> but if they're saying that you can buy a subscription to xbox game pass and you can use it on x cloud on your android device on your laptop on your you know your pc whatever device your chromecast your fire stick tv your apple tv whatever it is fire stick. Like, if that's a thing, then that's yeah. huge. But I feel like if... <laughs> like <a> huge. <laughs> huge. I feel like... Huge. Should we just do the show? No. Um, I can't help but feel, though, if that was the case, isn't that something you'd come out loud and proud and scream at the top of your lungs? Like, look at this amazing deal we're offering. So... Oh, who was it? The Verge? Someone reached out for clarification and asked this very same thing. And they basically just got a comment that was nothing but murky water. We have nothing like, to talk about at this time. <clears throat> yeah, because, I mean, that would be, an, like you were saying, you know, these Black Friday deals coming up that we'll talk about. But you can get the sad edition for 150 bucks starting November 14th. Oh, no, no, sorry, November 24th. Is then? I mean, at that point, though, still, I guess... Is it still worth it to get... But why would you have to buy an Xbox is my question. Like, why would you technically have to do that to take advantage of Game Pass? Yeah. Do you know it? I, I mean, from a, from a back-end technical perspective, you wouldn't really because you would just need to have an Xbox Live account, which you can get from Xbox.com. Right. You don't have to own an Xbox to have an Xbox Live account um, because you can have an Xbox oh. Live account technically on PC because it's tied to your Microsoft account, which is essentially like what you use across right. all of Microsoft's websites like Outlook, et cetera, et cetera. So I'm not sure why you would need to have an Xbox to make it work unless it was somehow tied right. to what's available locally on your Xbox a la remote play on PlayStation. But that's not what they've said. They, they've said that right. xCloud is cloud streaming. So they've essentially put an Xbox in the sky is what Phil Spencer said. Um, so, when in reality, I think we're hoping they put a PC in the sky. <laughs> PC in the sky with diamonds. Oh, that's not at all the tone. Wow, I totally butchered that. Anyway, yeah, PC it's, it's interesting. in the sky, the sky with, diamonds. with diamonds. Closer. There we go. Closer. Was, yeah, I mean, you know, we're really good at the singing. We should just stop the show and just start singing all of our video game news. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't know. Because then I guess it's like, okay, well, if they don't make you buy an Xbox, then are they eating into the sales of their consoles, right? Yes. You know, if, if, if yeah, right. So, if, like, if I have an iPad and let's say Project X Cloud is a thing, it's like, oh, wake up. I don't know why it's an accent. Here's my new Xbox. Ha, ha, ha. I don't know. Is that the subscription model they really want? I don't know. People who are a lot smarter than me who are paid to crunch the numbers and run all the things are figuring this out. But I'm really excited to see what they're going to give clarification on or how they're going to give clarification on this. It's interesting because... I'm with you, Britt, that it would feel like it's going to be cannibalizing <laughs> Xbox Scarlet people who are going to buy next holiday season when it comes out in 2020 if xCloud is available with Game Pass. I think the difference, though, is that Game Pass, by definition, will always have a finite amount of games available, whereas if you buy an Xbox, mm -hmm. whether it be an Xbox One, Xbox One S, Scarlet, what have you, you can buy essentially any game you want that's available on the platform that's been published on the platform, which you can't do. Game, game Pass is, has a set library of games, right? It's not unlimited. So I think that's right. the big difference, right? Is that especially for third-party games, if there's a lot of third-party games that you're like, hey, I really want to play this, those don't come day and date to Game Pass. They'll, they come eventually. But if you want to play Madden or FIFA or what have you, day and date, I believe that you still have to pay a premium to do so. Now, EA did talk 
on stage at XO19 today about their partnership with Xbox and what they're doing mm-hmm. to expand their partnership with Xbox, but that still doesn't include getting access to some of their biggest games for the price of the Xbox Game Pass because let's be honest, EA is never going to relinquish that, particularly for its most popular sports franchises. Mm-hmm. Um, I guess it would be a great deal if you are, you know, you don't ever really want to get an Xbox, but you want to get a PS5 for sure because, you know, first party titles come day and date to Game Pass. In that sense then why, you know, if you're like, I don't really want to buy an Xbox, but I'm really interested in Halo Infinite, so maybe I'll just subscribe to a few months of Game Pass and play Halo Infinite on my iPad. Like, I don't know. That just seems weird, right? Yeah. No, I'm. it does seem weird. I mean, the whole cloud streaming infrastructure seems the future weird. future is so confusing. And we're going to talk more about that when we get to our Stadia story. So let's just put a pin in it for now. <laughs> And say that we are looking forward to what Xbox is going to further reveal about X Cloud. But for now, it looks like they're just expanding the countries that the preview is available in, and they're bringing the preview to PC. Uh, we won't know more about the true functionality of X Cloud until next year. All right, and then we have some little tidbits from IGN. So Bleeding Edge, which is Ninja Theory's online brawler, has a release date for March of 2020. Yakuza 0, Kiwami, and Kiwami 2 are coming to Game Pass in 2020, which is fucking awesome. Halo Reach will be added to the Halo Master Chief Collection on December 3rd for Xbox One and PC. This is the only title initially available for the Master Chief Collection on PC. Kingdom Hearts 1.5 and 2.5 Remix and Kingdom Hearts 2.8 Final Chapter Prologue. Oh my god. We're confirmed for a 2020 release on Xbox One. Final Fantasy 7 through 15 are being added to Game Pass in the coming months. Those worth noting that does not include the MMOs. And Microsoft has announced for a limited time all Xbox Game Pass Ultimate subscribers, like Andrea was saying earlier, will get one month of EA Access, the premium subscription service, allowing you to play some of its games early and for free, in addition to three months of Discord Nitro and six months of Spotify Premium included and Game Pass Ultimate. And beginning November 14th, you can get three months for $1. So this is something that I think they glossed over on their stream, and I don't know why. Maybe it's because it involved a bunch of other streaming brands and they didn't want to highlight them but that they're doing this deal that includes wait let's just go through this paragraph again all Mm -hmm. xbox game pass ultimate subscribers will get one month of ea access they will get uh, well with the exception of jedi fallen order which won't have early access and the reason they're doing that is because of spoilers and we're going to talk more about that later um in addition to three months of discord nitro and six months of Spotify premium with your Game Pass Ultimate subscription. And you guys can get three months of Game Pass for just a dollar beginning November 14th. So beginning like by the time you're listening to this podcast now. So you can try out Game Pass Ultimate, Discord Nitro, EA Access, and Spotify premium for three months for just a fucking dollar. Wow. One dollar. I was at a dollar a month or a dollar total. Either One dollar. It doesn't matter. See, okay. To be I clear, mean, you only get one month of EA access, but the rest of them right. you get three months. And then Spotify That's, you get six. But the deal is three months of service for just one dollar. One dollar. I mean, this is a no brainer. Like, try it out. If it's for you, awesome. If it's not, cancel it. But, like, mm-hmm. don't tell me you don't have a dollar to spend on this. You do. Everybody has a if dollar. You, you can find a dollar, dollar on the street if you look hard enough. Well, what I'll say, if you have a dollar to spend on this, you should have a dollar to spend on patreon.com slash what's good games. Truth. Or two dollars. Truth. Sorry. We changed our tiers. We did. Anyway, yeah. Great day. Great deal. You know, check it out. Test the water. You're not out anything. You can probably find a dollar, like, in the street somewhere. You know, scrounge up some change. And get yourself Game Pass Ultimate. Yeah. And on top of that, you pulled this from Destructoid. The Mm -hmm. Black Friday deals that Microsoft is doing are incredible discounts. So if you aren't, a lot of you did write in and tell us you are interested in the Xbox All Access program. But if you're not, if you're like, nah, that's not for me, dog. um, You can get an Xbox One X for $349.99, which is wild. You can get an Xbox One S for $199.99 and the sad edition <laughs> is $149.99 which l- listen just don't don't bother with the sad edition okay if you're gonna be buying an xbox now get at least the s or just you know 
if you can swing it, get the X because that's what you really want. And it's only yeah. 350. The fact that they're making Xbox One X 350 and you can get three pa- three months of Ultimate for a dollar, like, whoo. They're yeah, really they're trying making to it. infuse people into their ecosystem. I'm saying, yeah, and they're doing all the right things because, I mean, obviously they're in a position where they kind of like needed to do this, but good for them. I mean, these are really very attractive offers, Andrea, you see. And like, you know, get the Xbox One X. It's a really pretty console and I give it my stamp of approval because I like it a lot. Yeah. We love That's our Xboxes. Yeah. Are you, do you Black Friday shop? I know we've talked about this, but I don't remember what you said. Oh, yes. <laughs> I'm yeah? a Black Friday addict. Um, not to go too much into it because I believe we did a secret segment on this a while we back. Did. Um, but I have not been a fan of how they've changed Black Friday over the last couple of years. I do not care for the fact that they open it in the middle of the day on Thanksgiving. I think that that's a travesty. Um, When they started it at midnight, I hated it because then it brought out all like the drunk assholes who were like, I'm going to party on Thanksgiving and then go shopping. I preferred it when they opened the doors at 5 a.m. and then you Mm -hmm. know who the diehards are if you're going to wake up at the fucking crack of dawn to go shopping. Um, or if you're like me, you stay up all night playing Mass Effect 2 or Mass Effect 3 and then you just go shopping when you're done. Um, that's what I miss about Black Friday. Yeah. I don't like now that they're do- they're making employees cut their day with their family short. But in order for them to compete, they all have to open. And now I see even this year GameStop is opening. And it's like I can't fault them, you know, that they're struggling financially and they want to – Uh, compete with all of the other retailers, they have to do it. And I've always said this, and I don't mean to get on a tangent here, but I stand by my feeling that if there are employees that want to work and want to earn the overtime and the holiday pay, they should be allowed to. You know, maybe they can't travel home. Like I never got to travel home for Thanksgiving for many, many years because I had to work. Because the night before Thanksgiving, the Wednesday before Thanksgiving is one of the biggest bar nights of the year because so many people have Thanksgiving off because it's a universal holiday here in the United States. Um, It's not tied to one religion or one sector of the government or whatever. It's like everybody takes it unless you work in retail now. Because before, everybody had it off, even if you worked in retail. The only people that were open were like gas stations. Um, And it's just, it's frustrating because I wish we could all collectively agree to take the day off. But since that's not where we're at and since the big retailers are struggling right now against online sales, I think that I appreciate their desire to want to, you know, stay competitive. And if that means that people have to go to work, that's a bummer. But I can't fault them for wanting to protect their business interests. It just makes me sad inside. I don't like it when you're sad inside. I know, me neither. Because it makes me sad. Can't we all just like eat turkey and play video games and watch football on Thursday and then go shopping the next day? God, that sounds so good. Why can't we just do that? that? Yeah, I'm very happy to be here with you right now, Andrea. I've been with you since about 1130 today. I know. And it's currently 4 p.m. Oh, dang. That's a long day for us, Britt. I know. But look at us doing the thing. But all I'm saying is turkey and football sound really good right now. Mm, Two weeks. Yeah. Well, it's Thursday. There'll be some football on tonight. Yeah. Are you ready for shout some out. football? Shout also, out to the Seahawks. Shout, shout out, out to Seahawks. your security cam video mm. of you, Jason, <laughs> and Rev watching the game winning oh my field, God, goal field goal on that Seahawks game. OMG. I, I think about that game and I'm like sad and excited and stressed out at the same time and happy because it's that was the most, I mean, probably like the best game I've seen in years. Probably. And this isn't me just being a Seahawks fan, but the amount of back and forth and the amount of action and how exciting and emotional that game was. I can't remember the last time I saw a game like that. That was like the epitome of what Monday Night Football should be. I don't want to see any more of these two little teams eh, kicking around a ball eh, and getting like a 3-3 at the end of half. Like that's not okay. That was football. If I had a mic, I would drop it right now, but I don't have one. So I'll just airdrop a mic. All right. Google Stadia. We can move on. All right. Let's talk about Google Stadia and how Ugh. it will be missing many features for Monday's launch. So this write-up comes from Ars Technica. As Google barrels forward towards streaming gaming with Monday's planned launch of Google Stadia, the company is talking about the many promised features that won't be available to founder and premier pre-order purchasers at day one. I'm and- doing my best Chrissy Teigen face right now. <laughs> 
In a wide-ranging Reddit AMA on Wednesday, Google employees said that missing features will start popping up as soon as one week after launch. <laughs> Director of product, Andrey Duranik, Kev Duranichev, Duranichev, Duranichev defended uh, this by saying that Google products always start with nailing key user journey and then proceed with releasing extra features. YouTube started with watch video. For Stadia, it's play the game on your biggest screen. Game platforms often launch with limited feature sets that get expanded via firmware updates over multiple years. That said, the list of promised features that won't be ready when Stadia launches next week is surprising in its breadth and variety. Variety. Here's a brief rundown of the limitations early adopters will have to face on day one. On day one, PC Chrome gameplay won't support 4K, HDR, or 5.1 surround sound. Those features will be added in 2020 for PC players. Stream Connect, which allows one player's Stadia viewpoint to be integrated with another player's stream, will not be available in any launch games. The first game to use it is expected to launch by the end of the year. State Share, which lets users share save files via links, and Crowdplay, which allows for a quick jump in at multiplayer through a YouTube stream, won't be integrated into games until next year. At launch, Google Assistant integration will be limited to the ability to turn on the TV and start a game. Soon after launch, the Assistant button on the Stadia controller will work with Chromecast Stadia home screen. Assistant support on PCs and phones during gameplay will come sometime after that. Family sharing, which lets you buy a game once and share it with all accounts held by family members, is not supported on day one, so you'll have to buy games for your child's account. The feature is planned for addition early next year. There is no Stadia UI for achievements or achievement notifications on day one, but if you happen to perform an in-game feat that would earn a specific achievement, it will show up when the feature is rolled out shortly after launch. <laughs> Chromecast Ultra units included in the Founders and Premier bundles are the only ones that will work with Stadia on day one. Other Chromecast Ultra units will be able to play Stadia games after an over-the-air update, quote, soon after launch. <laughs> The Buddy Pass that allows early adopters to offer a free three-month Stadia trial to a friend will be sent about two weeks after you receive your bundle, barring some unknown unknowns popping up. What? <laughs> What's happening? Currently, the phone is needed for initial setup and buying of games. Uh, buying games through a Chromecast Ultra or the web is not supported, and the AMA gave no indication if or when it would be added. As previously discussed, mobile support will be limited to the Google Pixel phones and Chrome OS tablets at launch. A timeline for general iOS and Android support is still to be determined, but Pixel will likely be the only mobile support this year, according to the AMA. Google says it wants Stadia to run on every screen eventually. As previously discussed, the Stadia controller's wireless functions will only work with Chromecast Ultra at launch. To use that controller with a phone or tablet, you'll need to plug it in with a USB-C cable. Generic USB-C controllers will also work with Stadia or PC or phones, but not on Chromecast. As previously discussed, only 12 titles will be available for purchase at Stadia at launch with 14 more promised by the end of the year. A handful of other previously announced launch window titles are still planned for early 2020. Mm -hmm. Wow. If that wasn't enough, it keeps going, you guys. Ars Technica found some other interesting tidbits from the AMA, including at the highest visual quality, the Stadia app warns that data usage might reach 20 gigabytes per hour. That's <laughs> above some previous estimates that's expected at 15.75 gigabytes an hour for a 4K HDR signal with 5.1 surround sound. Limiting the stream to 720p stereo quality via the app caps data usage at still 4.5 gigabytes per hour. You should expect regular games as freebies with your $10 a month Stadia Pro subscription, but Google can't commit to a solid schedule for their availability yet beyond Destiny 2 at launch. Similar services from Sony and Microsoft also mul offer multiple free games per month, <laughs> FYI. A personal Stadia stream will continue to run for 10 minutes after you shut down on one screen, allowing you time to switch to another device and pick up where you left off. Stadia will use letterboxing to fit the game image on screens that are not set to standard 1080p or 4K aspect ratios. And Google and Power Support have developed a Stadia controller grip called the Claw, the which claw. holds like liar liar. 
Yes, I actually have one of those, uh, which holds a Stadia phone centered and floating over the controller. Unlike generic phone and controller grips, it won't be included in pre-order bundles, but will be available uh, available for purchase <laughs> in the Google Store <laughs> in the coming weeks. <sighs> Whoa. Okay, so wait, the most important thing of all of this, what do you mean you have a claw somewhere? Um, so I can't show it to you because it's under embargo, but Google sent me oh, a Stadia oh. unit, a kit, uh, okay. to review Stadia, and we're going to be talking about it on next week's show. I thought we could talk about it on this week's show, but I reviewed the embargo information, and it's not it's not now. <laughs> so. oh. Miscommunication, because have you seen Liar Liar? Of course. Okay, the so claw. the claw. Okay, so when you said that you have one somewhere, I had it envisioned <laughs> like a hand model, <laughs> like on like a trophy pedestal <laughs> that was just called like the clot. I'm like, how have I never seen this? No, okay. I don't. I don't have that. Okay. I have the right, actual okay. Google Stadia claw. Um, okay. makes sense. Okay. So, wow. This is a lot. This is this like is a lot, a, a lot. Ton. And you know me, I'm the one who brings the sunshine and rainbows to the What's Good Games podcast. But like, what the fuck? Yes. And you, what's frustrating you, about this before you give me your thoughts, yeah, Brittany, yeah, yeah. I just want to make yeah. a disclaimer. This week... I did an interview with Jack Buser from the Google Stadia team, and he's fantastic. I love chatting with Jack. The unfortunate part was my interview with him happened not only before I got hands-on with my review kit for Stadia, but before the AMA happened. And so I'm not sure if we're actually going to be able to show or air you any of that interview because a lot of it was kind of rendered moot by the AMA that came out. So I'm going to go through and see if I can pick out some tidbits to talk to you guys about next week when we talk about our Stadia impressions. But for now, we're just going to proceed with our commentary based solely on the AMA. So I mean, tell me how where, you feel about this. Where do we start? There's like 18 <laughs> bullet points here, Andrew, Renee. No, I mean, like, like I was saying earlier, I think the biggest flub here, and there's a lot of flubs, a lot of flubs, but like the big one here is, not setting the expectation that this is going to be a very early access, a beta, an alpha at this point, I don't know, launch of this technology. You know, I am a founder. I am part of the, I bought the founder's edition way back when. Just because I'm more interested in the technology itself, the game, the 12 games that are being offered, uh, there's there's one that I think is the exclusive and it's, I think, the one about the I don't even know what, all I know is there's like blood and gory. Do you know what I'm, you know what I'm talking about? I, I can't remember what it's called. The exclusive game? Yeah, there's one. Um, well, it's you're about not a little about guilt, are you? Yeah, that one. That's the one. G Y L T. I think is yeah. how you spell it. Yeah, from uh, Tequila. Anywho, works. yeah, yeah, that's it. Uh, but the other twelve, you know, are games that have been out for a while. I don't have any need to play. I'm just more interested in the tech to see how it's going to work. But it sounds like I should just wait until soon after launch. And I put that in air quotes. No, you should wait until. <laughs> next year at the earliest like t there, there's based off this ama there is no way that i could ever comfortably convince people to be an early adopter no. for stadia like i am so disappointed in what they have brought here because i think once they're off the ground and all of these features are up and running i think stadia is going to be something really cool i think the tech mm -hmm. Is really cool. One of the things that Jack and I talked about in our interview was what Stadia is doing with developers from a technical standpoint on the back end to be able to allow them to do cloud processing and make features in games that they've never been able to even contemplate before because of the power of the cloud and the power of the server farms that Google has around the world and how Google's reach is so global that they're able to really kind of take the caps out of, off of their creativity and what they thought was possible on a quote console before mm -hmm. now I never got him to commit to me whether he thinks Stadia is going to surpass PC in performance and I think he probably didn't do that because the performance on PC is so variable depending on how you build out your custom rig right like it's all about how much power you're going to build in and Stadia is a fixed amount of power so it's absolutely more powerful than console but it's hard to say whether it's more powerful than PC. Certainly more powerful than some PCs, but definitely not all. And so they're in this weird gray area. And so I, I like that Stadia is doing really interesting, innovative things from a developer standpoint. But mm -hmm. from a consumer standpoint, there's mm -hmm. absolutely no value in buying into Stadia right now. Mm -hmm. Like none whatsoever. Unless by some 
case of the imagination, you haven't played any of these launch titles. Right. And just as a reminder, the launch titles are Destiny 2, the collection, Thumper, Kine, Red Dead Redemption 2, which to me is the standout in the launch lineup, Samurai Showdown, Tomb Raider Definitive Edition, Rise of the Tomb Raider, and Shadow of the Tomb Raider Definitive Editions. Guilt, which is the Stadia exclusive from Tequila Works. Assassin's Creed Odyssey and Just Dance 2020. Mortal Kombat 11. That's the launch that's available when it goes live next week. And then coming in uh, before the end of the year is Borderlands 3, Dragon Ball Xenoverse 2, Farming Simulator 19, Attack on Titan 2 Final Battle, Football Manager 2020, Final Fantasy 15, and Darksiders Genesis. Yeah. Uh, you know, it's it's so hard because, you know, like like you're saying, I think trying to innovate and do new things in this technology space, the future is the future all cloud gaming. Or, of course, like it kind of looks like it's heading that way eventually. Are we there yet? Absolutely not. That's like kind of like some of these issues that are like popping up all over the place. But it's... It's hard when you see this because you've been see. What did you, did you spill on yourself? I don't know what you're talking about. I look over and you're like shimmying the shit out of your boobs <laughs> or your shirt. So I'm assuming that's a yes. So yes. I'm going to have to go to YouTube.com slash what's good games to watch that around the, oh, I don't know, 50 something minute mark. Okay. Anyway. <laughs> yeah. So it's just, uh, it's hard because, you know, we all want to like support innovation because I think it's good. I think it moves the industry forward and it, you know, helps bring about change that might be needed. But when you see something like this, it just comes across as such a me too, me too. Like, I want to be a part of this. Like, Google's like, yo, let's put our Stadia in there and let's do this really cool thing. And then it doesn't live up to anything. And it's launching in such like a beta form. It just leaves leaves a really bad taste in your mouth. And I think this is something that we've kind of predicted would have happened. But I think, you know, especially as we came to launch, but when it was first announced and they're promising all these awesome things, it's like, well, if anyone has money, it's Google. So they can probably pull it off. And then you're seeing like, well, no, not yet anyway. It's just puzzling to me that they want to be in the gaming space and want to be competitive with the consoles and talk about this being the most powerful console ever. It's like you're not mm -hmm. rolling it out like a console is supposed to be rolled out. Mm -hmm. Nintendo Switch didn't launch with a bunch of things broken about the Nintendo Switch. Sure, That's the launch it. lineup wasn't like, you know, crazy, but there was still like a bunch of games that you could play. You know, I, I get that launch lineups are by by definition going to be limited, but the idea that they only have like one new game is kind of crazy. I'm just like, I, the thing that I am so puzzled about is why not open up your store to indies? Let indies publish on Stadia that are already out so that it gives people who want to play on Stadia something more to play if they've already played these big AAA games that are already available. You know, and it's, it's it's frustrating to me that that's just one component. I think the thing that we're kind of overlooking is the tech because the tech is supposed to what set Stadia apart. And like they're not launching uh, with full support for 4K HDR and 5.1. It's only available on specific platforms. Like that's crazy that PC Chrome gameplay doesn't include 4K HDR and 5.1 surround. Like how is, how is that a thing? That's to me uh, yeah. a giant is, is a giant fuck up. Um, so let's continue on down the list, shall we? Uh, <laughs> the family sharing not being available at launch. It's a bummer, but like to just say you'll have to buy games for a different account. Okay, that's crazy. Yeah, um, so mobile yeah. support being limited to Google Pixel. That's wild. Like, why not Android at the very least? Google Pixel. How many people have pixels in the world of mobile phones in the world? Um, I would have to look that up, but I, I can't imagine that the percentage is gigantic. Um, and then the real kicker to me, and this is the thing that I said I was the most concerned about when Google Stadia was first unveiled at GDC last year or earlier this year, excuse me, Oh God, was the data usage. And this to me is the most egregious part and the biggest hurdle that Google has to overcome Data usage might reach 20 gigabytes per hour <laughs> if you're using maximum settings. You can't promote the fact that you have the most powerful console ever created and that you can have 4K gaming with 5.1 surround sound, but then not 
mention, oh, BT dubs, unless you have unlimited data, you're kind of fucked. Yeah. I don't know, Andrea. I just don't know. If the proper expectation had been set that, hey, this is going to launch rough, we appreciate all of our founders, you know, committing to our technology and giving us a chance. Thank you. We couldn't do this without you. Kind of like I said, what Xbox is doing. But um, that's not what they're doing. And it's uh, it's just kind of baffling. It's I don't know. It, it's fascinating, honestly, because we're, we're in this new era, right, where this is going to be the norm. This is going to be the thing where pe- everyone's going to dip their toes in and see how well it works. Mm-hmm. So it's interesting to watch. I feel like in the rush to get out there and do this really cool thing that you're launching you're leaving a really bad taste in people's mouth not to mention this is out in just a few days and i haven't heard a peep besides like this ama and you know as a founder i haven't had an email in my inbox since when i pre-ordered it like i haven't heard anything and well I the forgot. it's probably because the embargo is on monday that's well no i mean even not not just like impressions of it but i'm talking about you know just as a regular consumer I haven't been kept privy or up to date with anything related to Stadia. Haven't they said that even founders could be receiving their Stadia units up to two weeks after launch? Depending on when, yeah, because they're fulfilling them, obviously, in order received. And it sounds like they don't have enough stock to give them to everyone at once. Which is wild because it's just Chromecast Ultras. Right. I'm not entirely sure on the details of that, but I did hear that. That is a thing. So... Yeah, I just like, just, I, yeah, it's especially after hearing the offering from Xbox Game Pass today and seeing what you can get also for PlayStation Now. And moreover, if you're looking for a way to spend your time with entertainment, Disney Plus, oh, my God, like that mm-hmm. launched this week with flying colors. Sure, they had some technical hiccups at launch, which was to be expected. But oh, my God, the library in that thing for seven dollars a month is crazy. I oh, just yeah. Yeah, I don't I, I wish they would have delayed it or I wish they would have just said, hey, we're going to launch this in, in beta. We're going to do a, a, if they a, like, had said like that, preview, you know, if they had said that we wouldn't be ripping this apart as we are, because it's like, OK, that's what you expect when you launch something in preview early access. But you didn't do that. And here we go. Anyway, welcome to the world of video games, Google. Yeah. It's, I it's would, a ruthless wasteland. And I, I normally wouldn't say this, but I kind of feel like if you have a, if, if there's still time for you to cancel your Stadia, unless you specifically want the founder's controller, like there's absolutely no, no reason to buy Google Stadia right <laughs> there, now. There really isn't. And I thought about it because I know what's going to happen. It's going to arrive and then I'm just going to put it in a corner until like next year or whatever when some exclusive game comes out. Like, oh boy, I have to try that. But for now, I... I it's just going to sit. So I might. I don't know. I wish I could say more about my hands-on because I have some interesting things to say about it, but I can't until next week's show. So um, hopefully you guys will come back and hear about my hands-on with Google Stadia. And um, that's all I can say. I don't want to cool. I don't want to break embargo. But Do you want to talk about a hedgehog? <laughs> Girl, I have been waiting to talk about this hedgehog. Yes, <laughs> let's go. And, and Sonic the Hedgehog, what, what, what am I doing? Sonic the Hedgehog movie redesign revealed in a brand new trailer. This comes from Destructoid. Paramount Pictures has released a new trailer for its upcoming movie starring one of the most iconic video game characters of all time, Sonic the Hedgehog. The new three-minute preview features our first official look at the blue blurs redesign, which is implemented following the less-than-stellar fan feedback to the movie's original trailer. Not only does the preview feature a new Sonic, but it also showcases a gl- glut. Is that the word? Gl- I've never heard that word before used like that. This- <laughs> is it glut or glute? Because I want to say glute because that reminds me of butts. Well, All right. it, I, yeah, I, it's definitely glut, but like, I like glute. I wouldn't, I wouldn't have used it like this. Will Is you it like glut, like glute? gluttony? I don't know, but I'm going to read it with glute. But also showcases a gluteus maximus, a fresh clips from the movie, which stars James Martson, Martson and Jim Carrey, mm, and is directed yeah. by Jeff Fowler. Also gone is Coolio's Gangsta's Paradise, replaced with a remix of the Ramones Blitzkrieg Bop. We also see the luscious Green Hill Zone, complete with its famous Loop of the Loop. Yeah, see? There we go. Yeah, it looks so much better. I mean, obviously, we've been talking about this since the, you know, first time shit went down and how terrifying Sonic was and how oddly human slash not human he looked and how I said if I saw his glutes, 
Man, we're seeing glutes a lot. I'm seeing glutes a lot in this episode. You but got butts I saw on them, the brain, girl. I got butts on the brain. Thinking of that yamper I'm going to get tonight. <laughs> uh, that uh, I would leave the, you know, I leave the theater if I saw Sonic's glutes because they would terrify me. But no, I don't even think he has an ass because he looks great. He's this little skinny, blue, cartoony looking hedgehog, and you did good. This is a rare occasion where internet backlash actually resulted in a positive outcome. And it's uh-huh. kind of, I feel double-edged about this. Part of me yes. is like, cool, they fixed the weird Sonic and now Sonic's better. But then the other part of me is like, I don't ever want to encourage communities to harass creatives about their vision because they know that they can get things changed. It's kind of a... It's kind of a bummer that the team, you know, kind of had to crush to it. But at the same time, like, that first Sonic was really whack. Really scary. Yeah, and I think just, I don't know who's listening to this who can benefit from it. But if you're going to do something based off of an iconic childhood mascot, whatever it is, like, bring people on board, you know, who can maybe advise about this. I feel like, I'm sure there are people on the team who are thinking, like, oh, this is not good but apparently that wasn't enough feedback to get to the big wigs like you guys need to change this or it ain't gonna be great for you this is like yeah he looks great he looks cute he looks like a little sonic and looking at pictures of the old one man just no i can't (laughs) just (laughs) no it doesn't even like feel like a thing that actually happened because it's just so i'm getting nauseous just looking at it well, right. then stop looking at it. Let's talk about yamper butts. Yamper, yamper butts. butts. Yamper, yamper butts. butts. I feel like you Butter. should read this one, too. Okay. <clears throat> oh, okay, I just had a moment. I just had a moment of realization okay. that it's currently 420, 424, excuse me, when we're recording this. And in less than five hours, Andrea, I'm going to be playing a Pokemon game on my Nintendo Switch. Yeah, girl. And that is just like... So fucking cool. Okay, anyway, so yeah, Pokemon Sword and Shield is out, um, I guess, by the time this show's out. And it's currently sitting at an 81 on Metacritic. So I have two reviews here, uh, one from IGN and one from Nintendo Life. These are just little blurbs from the Metacritic page and the review. I just want to read them real quick. So IGN gave it a 9.3 and said, Pokemon Sword and Pokemon Shield are closer to my dream Pokemon RPGs than anything that's come before. I'd still like better cutscenes, companion Pokemon, the complete Pokedex, and a more visually interesting wild area, but nitpicks are just not very effective, nice reference, when everything else was such a complete joy to play. The way they respect my time is wonderful, and the removal of monotony from random encounters and other odds and ends seals it down to the only pure and charming fun of capturing, training, and battling wonderful creatures. And hey, if I'm missing any tedious repetition, I can always get back to breeding that's a pokemon thing Uh, nintendo life gave it an 8.0 and said pokemon sword and shield succeed in bringing some new ideas to the table but they're also somewhat guilty of not pushing things far enough what's done right is done right but what's done wrong feels like it's come from a decade old design document there are moments contained within that are best the series have ever been but the joy is at times spoiled by contrasting moments that left us disappointed and did not match to the rest match up to the rest of what the the rest of these games can offer. What we've got here is an experience full of highs and lows from the unadulterated wonder and joy of seeing a brand new Pokemon in a stadium full of cheering crowds to the monotonous and dragged out dialogue we just wanted to skip. So, I, I, grant out, I, I haven't played Pokemon Sword Shield, but I will be remedying that very shortly. But the Nintendo Life review, I think, was what really stuck to me because I feel like that's exactly the kind of experience that, at least I, as someone who's played Pokemon since I was like, nine or ten years old well has expected from all pokemon games since blue you know it's you're gonna get something that's a little different a little different granted the leap to 3ds was pretty big but with pokemon switch a pokemon sword and shield on switch you know we've been following it i've been following it and did it do the breath of the wild remaster that i've been fapping about in my dreams absolutely not like that's nothing i've seen has pointed to has led me to believe that but i have said that i feel like this is a step in the right direction but i am not surprised at all that and this isn't the only review i read this where there are just some outdated mechanics and that pokemon sword and shield wasn't pushed enough it wasn't like the link to the past on super nintendo to the ocarina of time transition you know, that I think a lot of us had hoped for. Now, granted, Game Freak isn't the largest team, but still, I feel like that's something that could be remedied. Anyway, I don't want to get off on a on a thing here, but um, it's interesting to read 
to read the reviews on this and some people are loving it some people are like it didn't do it for me some people are saying the wild areas are boring some are saying they're the best part of the game so I'm just really excited to hop in and play but yeah. do you think though that in 2019 after the literal hundreds of millions of units that Pokemon has sold over its lifetime that saying the team is small is an excuse yeah absolutely it's you totally do think it's you do think you do think it's an excuse or you do think it's not okay no, I th- maybe I, I phrased think that wrong no, 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 no. This is what I think. I think, no, Grant, like the team isn't like a huge like Breath of the Wild ty- style team. That's what I mean for reference. But I feel like there sh- I don't know, but this is my guess. My hypothesis is that there are ways to increase the size of that team and hire many de- talented developers to increase the size of said team. So you can give, so you can create that huge experience that I think a lot of fans were hoping for. So it's an excuse in the sense that that is a problem that could be remedied. I don't, at this point, like, I I feel like Pokemon's been around enough and we've seen enough games do something, not not similar, but as as far as, like, open worlds go and characters and mini quests and cutscenes, like, it's not, I don't want to sound stupid when I say, like, it's not hard to do it right or do it good or or give depth to that because I'm not a developer, but I feel like there have been enough examples of these things done well enough where, you know, like Game Freak's very talented. They could easily turn this into something deeper than what it is. Yeah. Uh, so, yeah. So, like, I think it's an excuse in this. It's not not like a valid excuse, if that clarifies it. I think, you know, you can hire more people. You should hire more people to make Pokemon, like, that next step. Yeah, it's interesting because I feel like this was Nintendo's moment to really knock this out of the park. And obviously, this is going to be a popular game. Mm-hmm. And people are going to love it. An eight is a great score. A 9.3 is a phenomenal score. And I think that there is nothing wrong with doing the same thing if you can polish it and make it successful and you have a fan base that wants it. But what I would hope from a company as successful as Nintendo is with not only Pokemon with, you know, Game Freak and the Pokemon company, but also with how they've been successful with Switch as a platform, Mm -hmm. is that now when you're on the end of the console generation for your two biggest competitors, now is the time to strike and say, we're going to bring the goods and really crush this holiday season, knowing full well that we don't have to go head to head with Xbox and one of their biggest AAAs, and we don't have to go head to head with PlayStation on a big AAA for them because they don't have a big AAA out this holiday season like they had Spider-Man last year and they had God of War last year, right? And Xbox, you know, has Gears 5, but that came out back in September, you know, so it's been removed from the holiday long enough. And like, quite frankly, Gears 5 would never compete head to head with Pokemon, right? They're just two very different right. games. And I think that they really could have done something magical with Pokemon Sword and Shield if they mm-hmm. had iterated. If that fan art screenshot that everyone oh. was salivating over on Reddit was the vision, if they had Breath of the Wild eyes, <laughs> oh, oh, <laughs> you know, God. Pokemon, I think that they could have had something truly inspirational and done something amazing from a financial perspective and really kind of brought people into the Nintendo Switch ecosystem that either had been holding back on buying a Switch or people that had been holding back on buying a second Switch or a third Switch or hadn't got the Switch Lite, you know? And so it's kind of a a little bit of a disappointment, but that said, they're playing it safe. This is still going to sell millions and millions of units. It's still going to push console sales this holiday. Oh, yeah. I just would like to see them take a risk because they are successful enough that they can take the risk without it being devastating if they fall on their face. Right. Well, People and then will come it, back to Nintendo and to Pokemon no matter what. No, you're totally right. And just, you know, personally, I feel like it's, I mean, granted, like Metacritic is a whole bunch of different opinions mashed into one average, but I feel like 81 for the first console Pokemon game, like, isn't, I sound like such a snob, but it's, not like what I would have hoped, you know, like I, I, if, if this would have gotten like a nine or something cool, but no, you're, you're, you know, it's cause there's, and maybe this is just because I'm playing this game, this franchise for so long. There's just, this is a really big deal. Like this is a huge deal for the first time. This game is on, is on hardware that can really like push it forward. And like you said, they played it safe, but they don't need to, but do they need to when they're making so much money off of Pokemon rivals rivals? Is that what it is? I haven't played it yet. It's the it's the new either. battle game uh, in Pokemon Go. Like, do they need to put more resources into creating these console games? And if the bottom line is they want to make money, then no, because they're making enough already. 
So it, it's it's kind of hard, and I, like I struggle with it because I would like to see them do more. And because this is their first jump into hardware, the fan in me is giving them like a slight pass, even though the critic in me know it's bullshit because you know we've seen jumps that franchises have made before, and this is not that jump. If the next Pokemon game comes out and it doesn't do something bigger and wider and better, then I think at that point it's like, okay, well, this is never really going to morph into what, in my mind anyway, I, I have envisioned. Right. So, yeah. Anyway. So, yeah, I'm excited to play it. Grant, I haven't played it yet, but from, I've talked to people and it's it's kind of what you would expect. You know, it's not this huge, oh, my God, Breath of the Wild. Whoa. Oh, my God, such deep characters and interactions. Whoa. It's just more Pokemon. Okay, so to confirm, if I want to play with Ponyta, I have to get Shield? Yes. Okay. Okay, I'm going to try it then. Okay. Oh. You should get a Magikarp. They're kind of the best. Uh. <laughs> I, I'm not going to fall for that again, Brittany. <laughs> it's okay. I'll find something else to hoodwink you with. It'll be great. Okay, perfect. Um, and that's going to do it for our news segment. Boy, oh boy, was that a long one. That's what she said. <laughs> um, <laughs> it's time for us to take our break. When we come back, we're going to talk about what we've, been pl- <clears throat> what we've been playing, including both of us have finished the campaign on Call of Duty Modern Warfare. And, of course, our impressions of Star Wars Jedi Fallen Order. We'll be mm-hmm. right back. Welcome back, everybody. It is segment two of the What's Good Games podcast, and this is where we talk about what we've been playing. And this week, it's brought to you by whatsgoodgames.com. That's right, everybody. If you haven't checked out our brand new website, it's sparkly and new, and it smells like flowers. Like roses. Yeah, see? we have Great minds think alike. It actually doesn't mm-hmm. smell. A uh, little asterisk. Westside does not actually smell. Um, but... <laughs> We, uh, we launched it last week, so if you guys haven't checked it out, we'd really love for you to check it out. Let us know what you think. If you find any bugs, let us know that too. But also, we've got some new merchandise in the What's Good Games store, whatsgoodgames.com slash store. You can find our Teespring store for all of your favorite What's Good Games merchandise. And because it's the holiday season, our holiday apparel is back and better than ever. Not only is our classic What's Good Games holiday design available in a variety of styles and colors, we've got a brand new That's What She Said holiday sweater. (laughs) And it comes also in a variety of colors. So if you guys haven't checked it out, please do. Of course, you guys know that if you want it in time for the holidays, shipping is something you have to take into consideration. So maybe don't wait. Maybe just... Just go check it out. What's it's really cute. Store. Yeah. I made it okay. all by myself. I know. You did a really good job. Thanks. Yeah. I'm into it. I appreciate that. All right. Let's talk about Call of Duty Modern Warfare. So, Brittany, yes. you and I have both completed the campaign. Mm-hmm. You and I have both played previous Call of Duties. Mm-hmm. We are going to make this discussion spoiler free. That's possible, right? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, mm, mm, Mostly. Yeah. Yeah. Because I feel like there's some moments we could chat about, but I could, yeah, I probably should. It hasn't been that long. Yeah. It's only been like a couple weeks. Yeah. Spoiler free, it is. Um, okay. So let's talk about the campaign. What mm-hmm. did you think, high level, of what Infinity War did with this reboot? I, okay. So I, I enjoy the campaign a lot. But with most Call of Duty campaigns, sometimes it's a lot to follow, like, right off the gate. You know, they're, like, spewing all these bad dudes and these countries and all these things happening. And I have to find – I have to stop. And I'm like, okay. So I just completed an act. Then I would go into the Wikipedia and, like, okay, so what just happened in that last scene? I mean, do you ever ever have this problem, too, like, following what's happening narratively? Call of Duty in particular, I usually have a tough time following their stories. So just as, like, a recap for people – yeah. Um, who maybe are interested in hearing our discussion but aren't caught up at what's happening in the in the Modern Warfare franchise. So Infinity Ward began working on this um, after Infinite Warfare. 
and it is an entirely new engine for the game, uh, which you know makes the game look beautiful and gorgeous. So we're going to talk about that in a second. But when I talk, when we're talking about the style in the campaign, um, in 2019, during a covert operation to recover shipments of a dangerous chemical gas headed for Uzbekistan, CIA SAC officer Alex, played by Chad Michael Collins, is intercepted by hostiles who kill the Marine Raiders accompany him and escape with the gas. Alex's handler, Station Chief Kate Laswell, played by Rhea Kilstead, requests the assistance of SAS Captain John Price, played by Barry Sloan, in recovering the chemicals and de-escalating the situation with Russia. 24 hours later, a group of suicide bombers affiliated with the terrorist organization al Katala attack the Piccadilly Circus in London. SAS Sergeant Kyle Gaz Garrick, played by Elliot Knight, is dispatched to contain the situation with the assistance of Price and local police forces. Afterwards, Alex is sent to Yurzurkistan to meet up with the rebel leader, Farah Karim, played by Spoiler Claudia. Spoiler free. <laughs> <laughs> this is just, what are you talking about? This is just a, an overview. No, I know. I, I guess it depends on your version of spoilers, but. This isn't spoilers, though. This is like back of the box stuff. Who agrees to join the forces in tracking down the chemicals in exchange for his aid in overthrowing Russian forces led by General Roman Barkov. So that's like the okay. premise for the game, right? So right. that sets up where we're at. So we've got a terrorist attack that happened after this deadly gas was stolen. Uh, the SAS is trying to track down the gas and, of course, track down the terrorists who are responsible for the attack on London. Um, mm -hmm. And obviously, uh, Russia is involved because they're always <laughs> the big bads in the Call of Duty franchise, um, kind of like in life. Um, so <laughs> Um, and um, that's kind of where we're at. And what I appreciated about what, the, what they were doing with the campaign is that I felt at least with this campaign that these characters, we got to spend enough, enough time with each of them individually that I felt connected to them, unlike previous Call of Duties, where I was just kind of playing through the campaign for the fun, kind of bombastic moments. Whereas here, mm. I actually felt invested in what was happening to the team. So it's interesting you say that because... The last, I think the last campaign I played was, yeah, World War II. And that was the game where I felt the most connected to the characters out of any Call of Duty I've ever played. Like, I have a soft spot in my heart with Modern Warfare uh, because that was the first like, Call of Duty campaign I really started, yeah, I really started like hopping into and playing. But the, something about World War II really hooked me. And what I think it was, to go back, okay, I don't want to get too far ahead of myself. I, I like these characters, too. I thought they were very well written. I thought they did a really great job at making them seeming authentic, as, you know, they always typically do in these games, in these campaigns particularly. But something that I think this game was missing that would have helped me felt more invested, because to me it was more of a cinematic, like, playthrough. Like, honestly, if any of these characters were killed, it's not that I would have been, like, happy about it by any means, but it's like, okay, that's Call of Duty for you. Whereas in World War II, there were some moments where, like, oh, my God, is that person going to live? And I think what World War II did is they had those set quiet moments where you kind of just got to walk around a little bit and see some of the characters doing their thing. Whereas in modern warfare every level there was action 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 there wasn't really many where it was just you existing in the game and just kind of seeing what people are you know just like immersing immerse you know getting yourself immersed i don't know why i had a hard time with that one but um so that was because we had talked about it and i remember you had said that you cared about these characters in a way that you hadn't really cared for characters before and as i'm playing it i, I i'm invested in the story and i think it's good but like I never was on the edge of my seat. I'm with you in that sentiment that the edge of my seat, like feeling of suspense, I, I didn't ever really feel. This felt more like a dramatic action game than it did like a suspense thriller. And I think mm. that, you know, it's all about what kind of tone you're expecting or what you're going for. Mm -hmm. I do understand what you're saying about the pacing. I think it can be problematic and really, if you think about it, it's almost a little bit of a bummer for the entire artist, artist team who put so much work into building these environments and then you just like run by yep. them or you blow them up and then boom, they're gone and you're, and you're through. Mm -hmm. There did, did definitely feel like moments where I wanted to take my time and look around and kind of really soak in this really gorgeous animation mm -hmm. um but you but the pace of the game didn't really allow for that as a first person shooter call of duty campaigns are known for being like very linear very scripted 
uh, you know, very much like we're going to put you in this situation. You're going to get to right. play. There's not a lot of player choice. There's not agency. You're just you're really almost on rails at a certain point. Yeah, I can see that. But that being said, wow, was I blown away by how gorgeous this game is. And I feel comfortable saying this is the most beautiful game from an animation perspective I have ever seen. Mm -hmm. And that includes Red Dead Redemption 2, which was a beautiful game. But wow. Like, I mean, I just kept... I just kept having these jaw dropping moments during cutscenes, going, I cannot believe that this is the tech that's happening in video games. And I was playing on a PlayStation 4 Pro on a 4K television. And the code, of course, was provided by Activision. I probably should have said that at the top. I'll be sure to put the, the disclaimer in the in the show notes and everything so everybody knows. But like I just kept gawking at how gorgeous mm-hmm. this game is. And I knew from my time visiting Infinity Ward at their studio that they had put a lot of resources and in and, and research and technology into not only their animation, but into what they were doing with photogrammetry and what they're doing with sound tech and really everything, all of the components that go into building animation and building a video game and what, what that means. But like, oh, I, I just, oh, I, can't, I can't, I can't say enough of how good this game looks. It looks, it's, I agree with you. I think it's the most impressive tech I've seen when it comes to facial animations and even the voice acting is just like so phenomenal. So good. It's crazy because you're looking at, because I played on Xbox One X on also a 4K TV. And I'm just like looking at like, they do it so incredibly well that the characters don't even have to say anything that you can just see by the twitch in their eye. They convey such a strong message. You're like, ah, I picked that up. I know what you're thinking right now. And it was just incredibly impressive. And I think that realism really enhance some of the more tense moments of this and granted we won't go into spoilers but they went there like infinity ward went there and in many different areas and it was it definitely like while this wasn't my favorite call of duty game there are definitely those moments where i had to stop and like think about what i was seeing and have that realization that like this is real life for a group of people out there you know this isn't like granted what we're playing is fiction, but it's based off of the reality of, you know, people. And it, it, it really, uh, it really surprised me. And, you know, there are, I guess I can't, I won't spoil anything, but anyway, like, yeah, it got intense. And there definitely were those moments where I had to pause the game and just like, think about what just happened and like, wow, that affected me. No, I'm I'm with you. I think it's one of those, games that's designed to make you have an emotional response and if you didn't feel anything I think that Infinity Ward didn't do their job and the fact that you felt something means that they did do their job and they wanted to really make this gritty and authentic and real and I think they did from a very specific standpoint I haven't played um, much of the multiplayer so I can't speak to that we're you know really only talking about the campaign right now and so we want to make that clear that, you know, this these impressions are not about the game overall, but mostly just about what they did with the campaign. And what I did like is that normally in Call of Duty, you are getting the opportunity to use specific guns and specific levels. And you, once you take an enemy out, you can steal their gun if you want to. But for the first time, I actually felt compelled to use different types of guns in different situations because they gave me a design reason why to do that. Versus me being able to just blast an assault rifle at almost any enemy I see. I was like, oh, now I'm going to need to use a sniper rifle for this section. I'm probably going to want to take a shotgun into this section. And maybe I want to try this. Maybe I want to try that. And the use of the night vision goggles in the game was phenomenal. And how they incorporated that into stealth. And how you could really choose to go as stealthy as you wanted to or not. You could go in guns blazing if you were really confident in your gun skills. Or you could go really stealthy and go really sneaky. And I feel like that's something that's such a stretch for them because they've attempted to do these things in the past, but I don't think that they've been as successful as they have been with Modern Warfare. And I really just think that they've brought the Call of Duty franchise back to a place where I think we all know it could be and where it Mm -hmm. could go. And I don't know what took them this long to get there. Ah, Technology, man. No, I don't know. But something about this one, like I said, while narratively and the characters, like, they were fantastic. I didn't dislike them. These were my favorite. Something about this was like, wow. Like, this is, 
like you said, I, I, I can see this being kind of the, the, the staple of future Call of Duty games where it's like, this is where they, you know, remember when Call of Duty 4 Modern Warfare came out, it like blew socks off. It was, I think that was, was that the one that came with the night vision goggles too, way back in the day? Do you remember that collector's edition? Oh, I don't, but I'm going to look it oh, up. Oh yeah. I still have them somewhere around my, my house. Or was that Black Ops? I don't remember. It's been like 10 years. Anyway. Yeah. Like it, it it's, it's cool because I skipped a few years of Call of Duty campaigns just because, like, whatever. But now, especially after finishing this campaign and kind of getting a hint of where they're going next, it's incredibly exciting. And if you did enjoy the Modern Warfare games back in the day, there are a lot of similarities, obviously, um, with that and then this. And then I think you definitely should check it out. I believe it was Modern Warfare 2. Okay, that sounds right. Unpacked in night vision goggles. Based off um, what my my preliminary Google sh- search here. Oh yeah, no, I I remember those goggles. I went out. I was uh, with my parents at the time, and I chased a raccoon around their yard with my night vision goggles. Um, what? <laughs> yeah. Oh yeah, this girl. is a story that I've never heard. Oh yeah, no, they they live on like an acre, and they have a lot of critters around their house. And I was using them because you know that's what I do. And there was a raccoon, and so I chased it around their house, all around their yard, to like I was like I'll stalk in it. Granted, it, you know, didn't end well. I didn't. I just got muddy at the end of the day, that but it was right. still fun. Yep. That um, was well, we could test that with coyotes with my night vision goggles here. Perfect. What's good games Patreon segment. <laughs> um. So just to kind of put a pin in our Call of Duty conversation. I thought it was, the game was excellent. I thought the animation mm-hmm. was um, best in class that I've seen. I think the gameplay and the gunplay is top tier, as you would expect from Call of Duty and from Infinity Ward. And if you are into military shooters, this oh. is a game to not miss. And so congrats to Infinity Ward on a fantastic launch. We already tipped our hats to their fantastic week one sales. It's no surprise if they're going to be a sought after game during the holiday season. I think that they knocked it out of the park with the campaign Mm -hmm. and I would play this again. And I don't say that lately. Yeah. Even if you're not entirely into military shooters, I would because I mean, it's not like my favorite thing in the world, but I would say just for this year, the, the technology and just how great this game plays, it could be worth testing out if, you know, if you're curious. It's like, oh, what? Because I like we said, this is the, probably the best looking animated game I've seen and Andrea's seen. So, yeah, it's crazy. It's Do crazy it. gorgeous. Crazy okay. gorgeous. Now, oh on go. to Star Wars. Hum um, the tune, Andrea. Hum it. Um, which, which part? I don't know the dun, main thing. Dun, 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 You're doing the main theme? I don't know what I'm doing. I'm not the... So Star Wars, Star Wars Jedi Fallen Order... Obviously, promotional copies provided by EA. So thank you, Electronic Arts, for hooking us up with Star Wars Jedi Fallen Order. And yeah. just as a reminder, What's Good Games has worked with Electronic Arts this year. If that is going to um, color your impressions of our impressions, you're free to skip this section of the show. But hopefully you don't because we've got lots to say. And of yep. course, this is going to be spoiler free. We know the game just came out. So we don't want you guys to feel spoiled. And this is a very narrative heavy game. So we will mm-hmm. keep our discussions spoiler free for everybody out there listening. So Star Wars Jedi Fallen Order. Brittany oh. is almost done with the game. Yeah, I think I just had, I'm on the very last mission. So okay, I have completed the game. I played on an Xbox One X. What are you playing on? Yep, Xbox One X. Okay. And so far... I'm absolutely enamored with everything I've played. I feel like I want to go back and do a little bit more exploring. Mm. But I rewatched episode three, Revenge of the Sith, last night because Star Wars Jedi Fallen Order takes place narratively between episodes three and four. And I was like, man, it's been a long time since I've seen episode three. And so I was like, why don't I go back and watch it? And the call outs in episode three that you get to see in Jedi Fallen Order were really cool. And I'm really glad that I went back and watched it. And I highly recommend if you're a fan of Star Wars and you like the movies, that if you want to have like a little like 
precursor to Fallen Order, maybe watch episode three again. Man, Hayden Christensen still sucks. Uh, sorry about that. But the rest <laughs> of the cast is really great. That movie, that movie actually would have been really decent if they didn't have to cast Hayden Christensen as Anakin Skywalker. But <laughs> Okay, so I guess this is a good time to say, I would never call myself a Star Wars fan. I've appreciated the movies. I've seen them all like maybe once or twice, but I couldn't really tell you anything that goes on in any of them. So I think that's a good point to make because I'm the very casual very, very casual Star Wars fan. And then it sounds like, Andrew, you're a lot more hardcore than I am. Uh, I mean, comparatively to you, yes. I wouldn't well, call myself a hardcore Star Wars fan because there's a lot of the lore that I don't know. Like, I haven't watched Rebels. I haven't read any of the, um, like, the narrative material, like books or comics or anything. And so there's a lot that I have to learn about the Star Wars universe. But I've seen the movies, like, dozens and dozens of times. Um, and okay. I've played multiple Star Wars games, so I'm, I'm definitely into the lore and into the world. I'm just, it, it's not as big for me as some of my other fantasy series that I'm really into. That being no said, um, what they've done with the game, I'm, I'm really, really impressed with. I said that this game has the potential to be a dark horse for game of the year. And now that I've finished the game, I absolutely stand by that statement 100%. So I let's I'm like trying to figure out where we should start here. Yeah, I don't know. I, I, there's a there's a lot to break down here. So I guess I'll just start and then because like for me as a casual Star Wars fan, what I was looking forward to the most, I think, was to immerse myself into a Star Wars experience in a way that I was comfortable with. And what I mean by that is, you know, I'm not really a movie person, as Andrea can tell you. So I'm happy to watch a Star Wars movies like once, like I said. And then after that, like, eh. You know, but video games now I can I can do those. And so I was really excited to hop in and kind of get a taste of what life is a Jedi or life in the Star Wars universe, what it's like. And it's interesting because I had heard from you, Andrea, like your hands on preview from that one episode we did. But I guess I wasn't quite expecting the weird like mishmash of all the different almost genres, I guess. And a lot of people, you know, it's a Souls-like experience, but I haven't played those games. So to me, it's, I mean, I've played Soul-like games, but not like the Soul games. Um, and so, you know, you have, you you have these Star Wars moments where you're, it was the cinematics and you're, the music is playing and, you know, the guns are blasting and you have the lightsaber and it's making all these cool sounds. And that's like, it's super amazing. But then for me, I found like when you're not, balls deep in those moments when you're out just exploring you know climbing things and you know the, the gameplay is a lot you know like we've said when we saw the first gameplay footage like think of like uncharted slash tomb raider you know when you're traver in terms of traversal and some puzzle solving here and there uh it doesn't feel much like a star wars game and i don't know if that's because i don't know all the star wars ins and outs so i'm not picking up on little things that would like trigger my red flag that's like oh that's a star wars thing oh that's a star wars thing i feel like i'm just playing a video game a very good video game mind you because i haven't been able to put this down since i've been playing it but i was wondering if you also picked up on that or if it's just like my casual star wars fandom it might be your casual star wars fandom because i have been thoroughly loving how star warsy it feels and, you know, as you mentioned, it does take a mashup of a bunch of different genres. We've talked Metroidvania. We've talked Souls. We've talked, you know, action adventure. So this game is a third person action adventure at its heart, developed by Respawn Entertainment, of course, published by Electronic Arts. And you follow Cal Kestis, a Jedi Padawan who um, has been thrust into this situation where the purge has happened. Order 66 has been executed by the Emperor you know, former Senator Palpatine in the Star Wars universe. And so now all across the galaxy, they are executing Jedi as they see them. So the idea is that all Jedi are to be wiped off the face of existence. And so you, as this young Jedi, are trying to escape and you come across two people, Seer and Grease, who are your companions mm -hmm. throughout the entire game and who are phenomenal characters. Grease, I'm telling you right now, Grease is going to be in the running for our What's Good Game Awards NPC of the Year. 100%. Uh, we'll, we'll, yeah. get into, we'll get into that more um, next month when we do those awards. But 
Um, so these two characters, uh, so uh, so Seer is a is a former Jedi, and you learn about her story and her past and what what happened with her and uh, why she is considering herself to be a former Jedi and not an active Jedi. Um, but they take you onto their ship, the Mantis, and the idea is that you need to escape and that you need to go and collect this holocron, which contains a list of Force-sensitive children. Obviously, you want to protect that list from the Empire because if the Empire gets it, they'll go out and murder all of these kids, much like <laughs> Anakin murdered all of the younglings in the Jedi Temple in Episode 3. And so it's important that you find the holocron before the Empire does. And that's essentially the basis for all of the motivations of the characters throughout the campaign. And I don't really want to go into specifics other than that because I want you guys to play it and discover it for yourselves. But that's the overview of what you're doing in this universe. What I love about it, what I think makes it so Star Wars-y is that, as you mentioned, it has these really cinematic moments where the music pipes in and, and you've mm -hmm. got the stormtroopers coming after you and you've got to fight your way out of these situations. But then it has these quiet, really funny moments, which Star Wars is known for. Like that comedy element cannot be overlooked because I think without it, it's now taking itself too seriously and it's maybe getting a little dark. And I think that's what Star Wars really excels at, much like a lot of the movies in the Marvel Cinematic Universe, is taking this sometimes really like earth saving like grandiose ideas about you know heroes and villains and say we're going to ground it in human comedy and, and remind everybody that we all can laugh at the same things together mm -hmm. and some of the smaller comedy moments in the game I think really highlight uh, how effectively they're leaning into some of the Star Wars shtick you know, down to some of the hijinks that happen where you're like running from these people or you get caught over here with these people. I'm like, God, that's so classic Star Wars. And I had so many of those moments during my playthrough and it felt really nice as a callback for somebody who's watched so many of the films over and over again to be like, it feels like they kind of ripped that straight from the film. And what was wild is that after I rolled credits on the game, I went back and watched episode three and there's a moment when Obi-Wan Kenobi puts his rebreather in mm -hmm. and jumps up out of this water and starts climbing this wall in episode three. And I'm like, I do that in the game. That's like, <laughs> it's like straight in the game. Oh my God, they did the thing. And it was this really cool moment I had watching the movie going, wow, Respawn really nailed that in a mm -hmm. way that I didn't remember because I hadn't seen episode three for so long. It makes me now want to go watch episodes four through eight, uh, which I was planning to do before episode nine comes out next month anyway. But I was just so impressed by the world building. So what they do is you have BD1, which BD dubs, best boy ever, oh, BD1, your droid buddy who is with puppy. you. A oh, puppy. How adorable is BD1? Ugh, love him. Oh my gosh. So damn cute. And when you get an upgrade for him, he does this like little dance where he's like all excited that you upgraded him, um, which is super fun. And I like that his upgrades actually feel meaningful and they feel like they have a uh, impact on the gameplay, especially when we talk about a Metroidvania sensibility. You absolutely have to go back to planets that you've left or areas that you've left once you've uncovered these upgrades because then mm -hmm. you can get more cosmetics. You can unlock new secrets and things within the world. And it really... Not, um, I mean, it definitely reward. I think the word I'm looking for is rewards you for the for the mm -hmm. exploration. And in addition, you also get a lot of lore in the world that you learn by BD will BD one will jump off of your shoulder and run over to an area where there's something to scan and some information for you to learn. And you can choose to go over there with BD one, or you can choose to just keep wandering on your path, and then <gasps> BD one will come back to you. Let that baby boy scan his shit scan all of the things he's so damn cute yeah and i just i really appreciate that respawn took the time to build in all of these things that feel so universally star wars and worked so closely with the lucasfilm team to get that right and it just feels good and the can we talk about the lightsaber combat for a oh. second Brittany? it's it's yeah so we like i said like a super casual Star Wars -y. and just to clarify like the cinematic moments especially when you're on the Mantis and everyone's chatting like holy crap these characters are so well written and it's so funny and like 
even I pick up on that little like Star Wars charm, those little moments, even like a little dab of cheesiness, which is like perfect. Um, I think I was more talking about just when you're like on a planet, right? It's just you and you've been there for like 45 minutes and you're just kind of like wandering around. It's a really, it's really fun traversal and it's really fun to wander around and jump on things and climb stuff and find secrets. But I think at that moment, I'm like, is this, is this Star Wars like, like, is this the kind of gameplay you would want from a Star Wars game? Sorry, I know I'm like totally like dodging your original point you're trying to make. No, but like, no, it's is- okay. I think oh, we can come back to the combat in a second. I guess maybe what I'm confused about is what you think a Star Wars game is supposed to be, especially since there's been so many different genres that right. have been branded as a Star Wars title, right? Like, mm-hmm. what do you, so like, what are you thinking? What did, what do you, what were your expectations? I, and this is like why I, okay. I'm not entirely sure. So when I, when I, this is like the thing, like when it first opens up, like when you first have that opening cutscene, you know, I'm like, oh man, like, oh, this is so great. But then it takes you to like the first planet and then it's like, okay, go traverse, go find secrets, go find cosmetic things. When I think I personally was looking more for just not maybe more linear-esque, maybe something more around maybe what, what, Amy Hennig was working on like a, a more linear experience where it's like okay we're gonna you want like a Wolfenstein you... yeah something maybe more around like those th- those lines like like I've said though I've enjoyed every minute I've spent with this game the, the traversal and exploring and the combat and even when I'm not in those cinematic moments like I can't stop playing because it's just so addictive and it's so much fun but it, it's interesting because I'm finding myself just for kind of kind of forgetting that I'm playing like a super Star Wars narrative driven game and I'm really conflicted about it because I've I never have really felt like this with a game before if that makes sense Mm -hmm. um so I wasn't sure exactly like what I was expecting maybe something like I said that that maybe you got to go to a few towns and you just had those moments of of maybe more quiet where you get to walk around and kind of immerse yourself in in the different races of the aliens and whatnot, but all of the gameplay takes place at least where, you know, I'm on the last level in a planet where it's all about like combat and exploring. There's never like those moments besides like the few times on the mantis where you get to just walk and look around and see people in the star Wars universe behaving as they would. I'm with you on the solitary aspect of the exploration. There certainly isn't a lot of NPCs outside of your crewmates that you run into. Um, There are a a couple small areas where you have the opportunity to talk to a few NPCs other than your crewmates, but there aren't like, there isn't like a hub world, right? Mm -hmm. Where you get to go Mm -hmm. and like talk to vendors and and really be immersed. So I, I see what you're saying there, but I guess I wasn't looking for that or missing that. Okay. Uh, what I really appreciated about the exploration was that they sprinkled in just enough enemies to make it challenging, but they didn't overwhelm you with respawning enemies all the time. Obviously, if you rest, so that's part of the Souls-like system. Mm-hmm. Uh, you, when you get to a meditation point, which acts as a save point in the game, you can choose to go into your skill tree and apply any skill points that you've earned. You can choose to rest, which will then reset all of your stim packs and it will set your force meter and your health meter uh, to full, but then it will respawn all the enemies in the area. Or you can just choose to save your game and leave and, and continue on with your health and your force as is. And so because of that, I've, I, never, I never really felt the desire to have a lot of interaction. I think I get that there's a criticism to be had with any game that employs open world instances, but also has like an urgent mission that you have to fulfill. And this is something I just read about uh, talking about Mass Effect because we just, you know, celebrated N7 Day last week. And there was a lot of retrospectives on Mass Effect. And one of the things that people were talking about from an RPG perspective was how (laughs) Mass Effect kind of failed at saying, oh, you have this imminent threat to all life in the universe with the reapers but man i have to run an errand for someone on the citadel (laughs) every rpg ever man (laughs) right no and that's definitely an rpg trope for sure and there's a little bit of that in star wars but it's so minor there aren't side quests there aren't other i mean i guess technically there are some side quests but there aren't really like quest givers that give you like bullshit fetch quests in this game right 
most of what you have to accomplish is tied directly to your main mission. And the things that aren't tied directly to the main mission are 100% optional because a lot of them either just uncover lore secrets or they uncover cosmetic upgrades. And so it's really up to you as the player to decide how much you want to explore. I actually really appreciated that I went back and explored a lot of areas after having unlocked them because not only was I able to use my abilities to get to specific areas that I couldn't get to before, but I found upgrades that ultimately helped me in the boss fights to come. And if I hadn't gone back and done that, it would have made those fights substantially more difficult. But I mean, that's part of the Metroidvania gameplay, right? Is this mm-hmm. idea that you upgrade and then go back and traverse and explore. And I think that they gave you just enough of a push narratively to want to keep moving forward, but they didn't pressure you so much that you felt like you couldn't explore. Yeah, no, I agree. It's kind of thing where you're looking at your, oh, what's it called? The map and you have all the planets in front of you. The hollow table. Hollow table. And maybe Grease will make a, a remark like, hey, I know I heard there might be some really good loot on this planet. You can check it out if you want, but you don't have to. Right. Yeah. You know, and that's kind of at the point where I'm at is, um, you know, the Metroidvania, it's it's really well done. And the map, oh, God, and just like a shout out to whoever designed the these level levels. design, right? Oh, my God. And the dungeons and the temples or whatever they're called, like they are so well done and they do such a great job with scale which is why I know Steimer's gonna love this because she likes scale but you feel like it just feels like the levels go on like past you forever in a way that not in a bad way but it's like you you feel like you're actually in a world you're on somewhere because you just look around and there's just stuff everywhere and it's like man I am so tiny and insignificant but obviously like the levels are much more contained than that but oh they're just so incredibly well done um but yeah like I just you know, for me, like I, the Metroidvania stuff is awesome and you can go back and it's it's not challenging to figure out like what you have to do with certain areas. Like once you get the ability, you're like, OK, I get it. But I'm just kind of mainlining it right now because like the cosmetic stuff is cool. And the, but I don't have like a particular passion for customizing my lightsaber or like putting like a new oh. skin on BD1. Oh, I, that I makes mean, me so <laughs> sad, Brittany, because the customizations are so cool. They I mean, are. Let me, I've, let I've me be honest. Cal's poncho customizations are or whatever. I had him in yeah. the pink poncho the whole time. Let's to be honest. <laughs> but like, and I don't want to give it away, but the lightsaber customizations. Oh, it's chef's kiss. I love the lightsaber customizations. You can do some cool stuff. Absolutely. I've, I've tampered and I've, I've seen all the options. I'm like, this is really cool. But like, it's not something that I like get off to. Right. So. And that's a if, Star Wars thing that if you were right. like super nerdy Star Wars, you might appreciate more. And I think I have a deeper appreciation after having just attended the lightsaber workshop at galaxy's edge in disneyland with greg and tim and -hmm. watching them go through the whole process and having the people on on site explain like where that came from and what that means and so i have probably a deeper appreciation than you know for example you who aren't familiar with what that means in the terms of the star wars universe but i think they really nailed the lightsaber customization there's a lot of options there and it is cool to see like pick it up and then it does the thing you want it to do but like anyway basically all i'm saying is i'm just mainlining at this point not that i it, it just i th- i think well, what you're it is, almost not, at the end of the game you're almost i there. am yeah and i've just kind of skipped going back to other planets unless i need to just because i think there's not a real attachment for me with i i don't want to have to read all of the the lore entries and i just Hey, it's if it's like not for thing. you, it's not right. for you. Like, I no, think that's, that's any game, right? Like, if, the, right. if you're into the lore, cool. There's a ton there. If you're not, skip it. Yeah, like Dragon Age lore, I could tell you the whole history of that planet more than I could tell you the history of this planet I'm actually living on. It's just, like, obviously a personal preference. But if you're like me, you know, and not super into Star Wars lore, or maybe you just never really learned it, like, you, you don't have to do all of that stuff, which is what I love. I really appreciate that about this game is that I feel like you don't have to be a Star Wars fan, which I don't know if there's a lot of the, of, of them out there, but to pick it up and play it and enjoy it and appreciate it. So they did an incredibly great job at that because, I mean, I was a little worried. Like, is it going to be over my head? Am I not going to know what's going on? But it's been great to follow, and it's just I can't put it down. I'm kind of sad I'm going to finish it tonight, Brit- actually. Brittany, can we talk about the lightsaber combat? Oh, yes, finally, <laughs> finally. We can. We can go back to it. Oh, it's great. I <laughs> I was concerned with Respawn's history in the first person shooting space and how much I loved what they've done with Titanfall and clearly the success that they've had with Apex Legends. I was like, hmm, this is more hack and slash than it is shooting. In fact, there is no shooting. So are they going to nail this? And I feel like they kind of nailed it. It feels real good. 
Did you get the perk ability where you get to throw your lightsaber? Of course I did. Oh. I don't want to I don't want to explain any more perks as a um, no. as a spoiler as a spoiler thing, but but you can check the skill tree like it's oh. on the sc- but yeah, it's so good. Uh no, I was nervous about that too because you know, obviously in the movies like they make the, the lightsabers do really cool shit. And like that's not super easy to replicate onto you know, joystick, like analog sticks. You can't really do it that easy. But they do such a great job at making you feel like you are in control over what you're doing. They're like, oh, yeah, this is visceral. I'm a badass. You, you pull that thing out and it makes a cool sound. And you're like, ha, ha, ha. I am so powerful. And I will slice your head off, which you can't really do. But And I like how they've made it challenging because it's a reminder that Cal is not, you know, a full Jedi, right? Like he's an apprentice. Like he's still in training and his training kind of got cut short. And he was you know, kind of thrust into this unknown situation about what's happening with the Jedi Order and if all of the Jedis are being executed, like, are the Jedis going to survive and where is he going and what's he going to do and how is he going to finish his training? And um, I thought it was a really nice mix of him starting off weak and then gradually building his Mm -hmm. strength and getting more confident with each encounter that he had. And it felt like a natural progression. It didn't feel like it was outpaced in any way. That said, the range of combat levels is going to be intriguing to hear other people's experiences. So I started out on Jedi Knight. There are four difficulties. There's Story Mode, Jedi Knight, Jedi Master, and Jedi Grandmaster. And a lot of the difficulties, well, it goes up from Story Mode to Jedi Grandmaster, scaling, parry timing, enemy aggression, and incoming damage. And obviously, you know, like it gets harder and harder as you go up. <laughs> So I felt that Jedi Knight was pretty punishing in the beginning for what's dubbed like normal mode. Mm -hmm. I I dropped it down to story mode because I felt like I was dying at kind of dumb things. As we mentioned, you get penalized if you fall off the world. And you will because it's slippery. It took me a long time to get a hold of the controls because when I first started, it felt like the camera control was not great but then you just have to get used to it i do wish that they had made some camera sensitivity controls in the menu if there's one thing i could ask of respawn to potentially add in at a later date it would be camera sensitivity so i was a little disappointed that that wasn't an option but because of that you really have to kind of get a feel for cal's movement which means you're gonna fall and and die and if you're playing anything above story mode falling hits your health and you can only hit your health so many times before you die and you respawn you and respawn so, at your last checkpoint yeah. or your last little save point. Your last yeah. save point, which could be pretty far back depending on where you are in the world. So that to me was a little bit of a bummer. And so I dropped it down to story mode. But then I felt like the combat was almost too easy in story mode. And I know what you're yeah. saying. I know what you're thinking. We're all about baby ass baby mode here. And I'm not complaining that baby ass baby mode was easy. I was just <laughs> hoping that there was kind of a Goldilocks moment in between where we were with story mode and where we were with Jedi Knight. And I didn't get to my personal desire because I still felt like Jedi Knight felt too punishing for normal. Or, but if that's what the Souls games are, this is why we don't play them. <laughs> right. No, it's all about pairing and getting that timing down, which is why obviously we've talked about this. The easier you go, the more of a grace window you have to to, to parry, to reflect those blaster beams back and whatnot. But no, I'm with you. I started also out on the normal mode. And once I started falling because of the platforming and losing health, and then I lost all my health and I spawned back like maybe 15, 20 minutes. I was like, nope, like nope, nope, nope. And then I took it down to baby ass baby mode. But then it's hard because it does feel almost too easy. So I'm with you. But the combat is really fun. So you kind of want that little challenge there. Yes, but because it feels so good. But then, then, you know, I don't want to, you know, get frustrated. So like I also didn't get that perfect Goldilocks moment, but it, it's it all worked out. It, it's great. It, it's so fun to upgrade your perk system and get those really cool skills that like we won't obviously talk about besides the one I already <laughs> kind of talked about. Yeah, the special a- like lightsaber attacks that you can unlock make combat so much fun. Mm hmm. Yeah, I like I said, like it's it's just it's fun. It's just a really fun game to play all around. I've had a few technical issues, you know. The games crashed on me once right after I saved, thank goodness, which was awesome. Um, 
but like in while like the cinematic cutscenes look so freaking good the once you're actually playing like cal's hair kind of looks like plastic a little bit and like oh that's interesting there are uh, some wonky uncanny <laughs> valley moments with the humans in the game particularly when you are talking to them when it's not in a cutscene. like mm-hmm. if you're talking to them on the ship or outside the ship or something like that there's kind of like a little bit of stiffness which you know is a little bit of a bummer considering that this is a Star Wars game you kind of had hope that they would be able to gloss that a little bit more mm-hmm. but the non-humanoid characters I think look phenomenal yeah, I can't really mess those up. They don't got lip. Oh my god, the stormtroopers! I just gotta say, their banter when you're like coming <gasps> up on them. Oh my the god, it's so good. Say, the the stormtrooper oh, dialogue. It's so I feel good. almost bad for them. Is that a normal thing? Do you feel bad for stormtroopers? Because while I'm sure they're jerks and done mean things, they're just like idiots in a suit. Like that's what I've learned. They're just they're all stupid. And like you, you it, let's say you're going against four of them at a time. You get three out of the four. The last one there is like, I'm the only one left. <laughs> he's, he's like, oh no. Or like, I knew it would end this way. Like they say really funny stuff. And they're just, like I said, probably being paid minimum wage. They don't know what they're doing there. And I feel bad for killing them. But I mean, you do what you got to do. Yeah. Gotta the banter XP. between the stormtroopers is like probably one of my favorite parts of this game. When you like are coming up on them on a new level and they don't know you're there yet, just like standing there and like listening to them go back and <laughs> forth is hilarious. So hats off to the narrative team um, at Respawn for a job well done with your NPCs because it's uh, so much fun to just listen to them and be in and around the world and to explore. And the like we said, the level design is fantastic. The combat is super fun. And they I think that they nailed the arc of this story too. And it feels like it fits very succinctly in the Star Wars universe, much like a Rogue One, um, it, you know, did where it's definitely its own standalone story and it has pieces of the ep- nine episodes, um, you know, that's referenced in it, but it doesn't feel like it's contingent on those. And I, I love that. I love that, you know, there's callbacks and you see characters, you know, like Saw Gerrera, right? Like some of the, the Wookiees and things like that. But I just... I'm so glad that they nailed it. I'm so glad that this game was good. I know. I really, really loved this game, you guys. I had so much fun playing it. It's just puzzling that the embargo is so late. You know, I I feel like, you know, typically in the video game realm, if an embargo is at launch, sometimes it's because like, oh, shit, we don't want to talk about how bad this game is before it launches. Everyone's going to whatever. This is, I mean, they had nothing to fear, I feel like, with this game. I feel like... Spoilers, that's it. Yeah. Yeah, like, that's it, man. There's just nothing really to fear. It's it's great. It's, you know, like I said, even as a casual Star Wars fan, like, I'm having a great time. I know that there's going to be people out there that hate this game just because it's an EA published game. And that, to me, is a travesty because the work that Respawn Entertainment did on this game should be commended. And I think that they did a phenomenal job with this game and... I really hope that we see it in the nominees for game of the year this year because I I really, really enjoyed this game. So we hope that you guys go out and play it if you're interested in Star Wars. Of course, there are plenty of ways to watch other people play it on Twitch and YouTube if you're like, ah, I don't want to spend the money on it. But if you enjoy anything about the Star Wars universe and you like action adventure games that have challenging puzzles, witty banter, fun comrades exploration and cool lightsabers i mean like (laughs) kind of a no-brainer yeah no i agree i was i wasn't sure how this game would vibe with me but yeah it's and this is canon right this is a canon it's officially part of the star wars canon now hey look at me i know the star wars now but and a part of me was secretly hoping that we'd see you know, some of the characters that we met in this game at some point in the Star Wars series, but where we're at now, like, timeline-wise, I don't know if that's even possible. Unless they make, like, a movie in between the other movies. Which they might do eventually? I would hope so, because this cast, these cast of characters is really good. They're all, like, in Greece, it's just like, Oh my god, so damn funny! Who so I don't know who voice acts him, but so good. Oh, I Ugh. have an I have that name. He's played by. Let's see here. I literally just typed his name into the search bar. Grease is played by Daniel Roebuck. 
All right, Daniel, sir, you're great. You did a really great job. Yeah. Yeah. And that's all we have to say about that. And I think on that note, we'll wrap up the show, shall we? Oh, my goodness. Next this is week, a beefy. I know, right? Beefy uh, mm. Over two hours for the show this week. And we were like, ah, Simer's gone. We've got XO. It'll be a short one. And originally, I thought <sighs> we were going to talk about Stadia for the third segment. But now that I can't talk about it until next week, we're going to move our Stadia impressions and um, some follow-up with my interview with Jack until next week's episode when Steimer is I'm so excited. I've missed her. I know. I don't know. That was a weird voice. That was weird. I've forgotten what she smells like. Oh, she smells <laughs> so good. She smells like Fleur. I um, know. Siana. Fleur.com. Yep. Um, ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much for listening and hanging out with us here at What's Good Games. Again, if you want to watch our XO Live Reactions, YouTube.com. Actually, no, not that one. Twitch.tv slash <laughs> What's Good Games is where you want to watch it because we got a content ID on YouTube. Uh, if you guys want to participate in our fantastic Patreon-exclusive streams, Patreon.com slash What's Good Games is the place to do it. If you want to get your hands on one of our brand new holiday items in our merch store, What's Good Games.com slash store is the place to do that. We love you guys. Thank you so much. Have a fantastic weekend. Play some video games and we'll see you next oh. week. 